This is Jocko Podcast number 300 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. And also joining us tonight, Dave Burke. Good evening, Dave. Good evening. The Secretary of the Navy takes pleasure in transmitting to First Lieutenant Schmedley Darlington Butler, United States Marine Corps, the Brevet Medal, which is awarded in accordance with Marine Corps Order Number 26 for distinguished conduct and public service in the presence of the enemy while serving with 2nd Battalion of Marines near Shenzhen, China on 13 July 1900. On 28 March 1901, First Lieutenant Butler is appointed captain by Brevet to take rank from 13 July 1900. Awarded for actions, War Department General Orders Number 177, December 4th, 1915, the President of the United States of America, in the name of Congress, takes pleasure in presenting the Medal of Honor to Major Smedley Darlington Butler, United States Marine Corps for distinguished conduct in battle in the engagement of Veracruz, Mexico on 22 April 1914. Major Butler was eminent and conspicuous in command of his battalion. He exhibited courage and skill in leading his men through the action of the 22nd and in the final occupation of the city. Awarded for action. The President of the United States of America, in the name of Congress, takes pleasure in presenting the Medal of Honor Second Award to Major Smedley Darlington Butler, United States Marine Corps, for extraordinary heroism in action as commanding officer of detachments from the 5th, 13th, 23rd Companies, and the Marine and Sailor Detachment from the USS Connecticut. Major Butler led the attack on Fort Riviere, Haiti, on 17 November 1915. Following a concentrated drive, several different detachments of Marines gradually closed in on an old French bastion fort in an effort to cut off all avenues of retreat for the Keiko bandits. Reaching the fort on the southern side where there was a small opening in the wall, Major Butler gave the signal to attack and Marines from the 15th Company poured through the breach, engaged the Caicos in hand-to-hand combat, took the bastion, and crushed the Caico resistance. Throughout this perilous action, Major Butler was conspicuous for his bravery and forceful leadership. So there you go, Major Schmedley Butler, uh, United States Marine for 34 years. Fought in the Philippines, China, Central America, fought in the Caribbean during the Banana Wars, fought in World War I, although against his wishes he was more in a support role. He's one of only 19 men in history to receive two medals of honor. He's one of only three men to receive the Marine Corps Brevet medal and the medal of honor and he's the only man in history to receive two medals of honor and the brevet medal and with that career after he retired from the marine corps he wrote a book called war is a racket you heard that right war is a racket this is a book that harshly condemns war, denounces the military industrial complex, vilifies the captains of industry and politicians along the way, and disparages Americans, America's foreign actions in war. So there's a bit of an about face going on. And, and these are some extreme views that he has. And when individuals make extreme statements, sometimes that's not the best approach to take because sometimes extreme statements, though they may be true or parts of them may be true, it can also alienate the general populace and, and kind of lead people to throw the baby out with the bathwater on some stuff, meaning that 
they throw away someone's ideas. They throw away all of someone's ideas because some of the ideas that the person has or the way that they state them is in an extreme manner. Which is, I personally don't think it's a good idea. Well, it's a good, it's a good thing to understand. It's a good thing to understand because what that should tell you is that if you, if you back off the extremity of your statements a little bit, you're gonna get more people to listen to them. So that's a good thing to understand. And it's also a good thing to understand that if people are talking in a really extreme way, you shouldn't just say, ah, you know what, no, this person's just crazy, I'm not gonna listen to them. Maybe you should actually listen to what they try and say and decipher what's just extreme and maybe not true, but are there kernels of truth in what people are saying? So I think it's a smart idea for us to listen. And I think as we have watched America's withdrawal from Afghanistan in the late summer of 2021, after 20 years of war, after thousands of lives, after trillions of dollars and no progress, maybe we should at least listen to what this Marine Major General, Smedley Butler, one of the most decorated Marines that ever lived, maybe we should listen to some of what he has to say and see if there's some things in there that make some sense. We have to get a little basic understanding of Smedley Butler, who he was, where he came from. Um, Born July 30th, 1881. Eldest of three sons. Father was a lawyer and a judge. And a judge. He came from a good background. His grandfather was a congressman, and his and his father was connected. He was a connected guy. And Smedley Butler went to an exclusive private school, which is sort of an East Coast thing. I mean, I guess they have them out on the West Coast, but on the East Coast is a bigger thing to have exclusive private schools. He went went to one called the Haverford School. And so you kind of get this image, you know, you kind of get this image, okay, well, you know, he's this rich kid that went to this exclusive school. And then you hear that he left school 38 days before his 17th birthday to enlist in the Marine Corps. (laughs) Which is, I think we have to give him credit, right? We just have to say credit. That's pretty much what you say, credit. He still got his diploma. They allowed him to graduate. He lied about his age and gets commissioned to second lieutenant. So I don't know how he pulled that off. But this is back in the day, man. There's no records. You're just showing up. How old are you? 23. I went to college, whatever. People are like, oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? This is back in the day. There's no. Isn't it the kind where like your ID card is written in with yeah. like by hand? Yeah, you like mm-hmm. change that one to a seven yeah, and we're just, good. Yeah, or you just yeah, erase yeah. it. Just whatever. making adjustments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I feel like I missed out on a lot of stuff in life because I didn't have that kind of. I mean, we were close, you know, but Mm -hmm. we were just, they were still tracking stuff. Mm -hmm. So he's 16 years old and he leaves his high school to go and join the Marine Corps. Shows up, gets a commission as a second lieutenant. And he's at the Spanish American War is going down, but he gets there a little late. um, Ends up showing up in Gitmo after it's been invaded, after it's been captured. Doesn't really see any combat. Gets assigned to the to the Philippine American War. He shows up there. He's bored at first. Gets in trouble, gets temporarily temporarily relieved of command cuz he's drunk and doing whatever. Mm-hmm. Gets his job back, however. Um, October 1899 he gets his first combat action. Leads 300 Marines in to take the town of Novaleta. One Marine's killed, 10 are wounded, his first sergeant's company, first sergeant's wounded. There's a little note about him like panicking at first, a little bit, and then he kind of gets composure. Ends up in the Boxer Rebellion. So Battle of Qin Sin, this is in China. He, he definitely kind of shows up now. There's a, a wounded Marine officer, and he is in the trench. Um, Smedley Butler's in a trench and he exposes himself to enemy fire to rescue this Marine. He ends up getting shot in the thigh. His commanding officer, Major Waller, who later became the best man at his wedding, he commended him and wrote, 
for such reward as you may deem proper for the following officers, Lieutenant Smedley D. Butler, for the admirable control of his men in all the fights of the week and for saving a wounded man at the risk of his own life under very severe fire. And that's what got turned into the brevet promotion, which which the brevet, um, if my memory serves me correctly, the Marine Corps had it for like maybe 20 years, and it basically was you're getting promoted. It was a promotion. So that's why even when I read it, it says, oh, he went from first, from, from first lieutenant to captain. It was a promotion, and then they, people that got promoted that way, they eventually got an award called the Brevet Medal, which looks like the ribbon of a Medal of Honor. You know, the Medal of Honor has the white, it's, it's a light blue. The Brevet, with the light blue with stars, the Brevet is red with stars, but it looks very similar as far as the ribbon goes. So he gets that promotion. He ends up in the Banana Wars. These are police actions. And these are police actions that we're conducting to maintain, you know, trade and and the way we want things to be, in, the way America wants things to be in Central America and in the Caribbean. Honduras. Rolls into Honduras. He gets tasked with defending the U.S. consulate during a revolt there. He rescues the consulate in Trujillo. He gets this nickname. His nickname is Old Gimlet Eye. Gimlet is a is a hand drill. It's something that it's a tool. It's an old school tool that used to drill wood. So he had this piercing look that he would give people, and they called him Old Gimlet Eye. Uh, broken service. He gets out gets married, has kids, runs a coal mine in West Virginia, goes back in the Marine Corps. It must have been easy to get in and out of the Marine Corps back then. He does it a couple times. More fighting in Central America. Battalion commander in in Nicaragua. Fought in the Battle of Mazaya. Leads the assault, the bombardment, the assault, and the capture of Coyotepe Hill. Next up is Vera Cruz. These guys are, he's rolling. I mean, they're doing, they're, they're getting it on with these low intensity conflicts. I remember one of my old senior chiefs said, what we need is a low intensity conflict in a high per diem area, <laughs> <laughs> which I always got a kick out of. So that's what he's got going on. These guys are in low intensity conflict, high per diem area. Mexico, Vera Cruz, first medal of honor. So they end up going through Vera Cruz. They're kind of clearing it door to door. There's 5,800 sailors and Marines on this operation. 17 killed in action, 63 wounded in action. Which, if you think about that, there's 5,800 sailors and Marines, there's 17 killed. This is, so the, the, the fighting, I'm trying to say that the fighting wasn't that extreme. But there was medals of honor given out pretty, pretty um, uh, a lot. So one army guy got a medal of honor, nine Marines got a medal of honor, and 46 Navy sailors got the medal of honor from this action at Veracruz. So he eventually tried to return the medal and said, hey, I didn't do anything to earn this. And they, not only did they tell him to keep it, they told him you better wear it too. So that's his first medal of honor. He didn't feel comfortable about it, um, but he got it. Haiti, second medal of honor fighting the Haitian, the Caicos rebels, the rebel group down there. And they have this stronghold, you kind of heard me talk about it in the in the citation there. But he's getting the Medal of Honor, the, the whole battle was 20 minutes long, this assault. There was one Marine wounded, and he was wounded by being hit with a rock in the face. All 51 of the rebels were killed. So he got the Medal of Honor for that, and that's what happened. Um, after that, he became like a public administrator or sort of sort of the military, I don't know, mini dictator, kind of running things a little bit, the public works and keeping things, you know, the social order. And he also, it's also said that they hunted the remaining rebels like pigs. <sighs> World War One comes around. He requests, he wants to go into combat again. Um, He had a reputation of being brave. He had a reputation of being smart. He also had a reputation of being a little bit of a 
a little bit of a rebel, a little bit unreliable. And, and so I don't know if that's why they decided not to put him in combat, because I'm thinking if World War I, they would have been like, oh yeah, you're just the guy we're looking for. <laughs> you're brave and you're smart, but you're super crazy. Come on up to the front lines. We got something for you. But they didn't. He ended up running this debarkation depot you know, in the rear. And the, by all accounts, he did a great job and squared this thing away. It was, it was a real mess when he showed up and he squared it away. And he got the Army and the Navy Distinguished Service Medal. Um, after that, he goes and he's the commanding general at Quantico. When he was the commanding general. This guy was always doing something. He's one of those people, like, he always was doing something. When he was the commanding general at Quantico, they used to form up the troops and they would march to various battlefields, c- Civil War battlefields, and do reenactments. And he would lead the marches. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's just, they, they march from Quantico to damn Gettysburg, right? And he was in front leading it. And they got up there, let's do, let's do the walk at Gettysburg. So, so then he's, so he gets done with that. Now he has a broken service. And he becomes the Philadelphia Director of Public Safety. And, and, and this is like, I might need a movie reference here, Echo Charles. Yes, sir. Uh, what's a movie where they're like gangsters, they're trying to crack down Untouchables? Sure. Okay. Untouchables. He, so there's, there's, this is the time there's speakeasies and the prohibition is going on, and he comes like law dog, right? He, is go- he comes into, he has a personal war on crime for two years. And it seems like, when, when you read about it, it seems like it's its own movie, right? This guy is going in just ready to take things on. He, w- he wasn't allowed to fire, if I remember this correctly, he wasn't allowed, he found out he wasn't allowed to fire individual police because the union and whatever. So what he did was he would just take and just move them all around all the time. So they didn't have, they didn't have time to get to get to know the local criminals and get paid off. So he just moved them all the time. They were moving. That's like one of the things that he did. And he he made a lot of enemies because of so many people are corrupt. Mm-hmm. Made a bunch of enemies. Finally, he gets kind of a little bit. He did it. Does it for two years. He cleans up a lot of stuff, but also makes a bunch of enemies. His final shot in the papers before he went back in the Marine Corps. <laughs> he said cleaning up Philadelphia was worse than any battle I was ever in. <laughs> uh, when he comes back in, he's comes comes the uh, base commander in San Diego. Deployed with the Marine Expeditionary Force to China, does a good job there. Politically influences a bunch of people, makes major general at forty eight years old. And in that time, also his dad died, and his dad was super influential. He was, like I said, he was always kind of, he always kind of had a spotlight put on him. And one of the things when Mussolini's now in power, he, and there was some weird, um, like a conspiracy about Mussolini and hit and run or something like this, I forget. But he sort of spread those rumors. You know, I think if he had Twitter, he would have been a real popular Twitter dude because he started spreading this guy. You know, this guy's a murderer and. And the Italian government. This was before the war. And the Italian government was like, "Hey, get." Get your boy in check, and they pressured the Sec Nav to to court martial Butler, and they did. They court martialed but- Butler. I think he was the highest ranking military person to be arrested after the Civil War. So he got arrested, and he apologized. And they let him off with a reprimand. Um, the Commandant of the Marine Corps died at the time, and he was kind of in the running. And he ends up. It's pretty obvious that he's a he's not enough of a company guy to get Commandant, and he doesn't get it. So he retires from the Marine Corps, October 1st, 1931. He starts going on like a lecture tour, speaking, and he gets paid for it. He donates a bunch of the pay that he gets for the unemployment relief. He runs for Senate, he loses. He supports the Bonus Army, which was when the World War I vets, they had these things called service certificates that that they bought, and when they bought those things, they had, again, I'm, I'm sorry if this isn't perfect, but it was something along the lines of, when you bought these things, they had like a 20-year maturity time on them. 
and the depression's going on, and everyone's like, hey, we want that money. And all these veterans, thousands and thousands of veterans are, are saying, hey, we, you know, we gave you that money, we bought those service certificates, which are like bonds, we want, we want to cash them in now. And the government was like, hey, those are 20 years, man. You bought those in 19, you got another, you got another few years before you can cash those things in. And this is when they had all the, the big standoffs in the, you know, the, the World War I veterans march down and set up camp in Washington, D.C. And he, he supported that. <sighs> Gave more speeches. Uh, here's, a, here's an example. This is, what, this is when we know where he's heading mentally, right? I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, we can see what his angle starts to become. This was, and this was a, a summary of one of his speeches that was published in Socialist Magazine that was called Common Sense. It says, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service, and during that period, I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico, and especially Tampico, which is a city in Mexico, safe for American oil interest in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1902 to 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interest in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China in 1927, I helped see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. So he's kind of pissed. Mm-hmm. 1934, it, again, this guy would have been all over Twitter. 1934, he's sort of the leader of this thing that was called the business plot, which was this, that there, there's this, this conspiracy that there was this plot for business leaders to overthrow Be- President Roosevelt. And in 1935, he wrote this book called War is a racket. Now, we're gonna read it. Um, Some of it's extreme. Some of it may be too extreme. Some of it's not accurate. Some of it's his feelings, his emotions. Um, You know when Colonel David Hackworth, when he went and talked to the press, and you and I have had that discussion, Dave, like did he give up his influence? He could have been a division com- or a brigade commander next and a division commander. And, and I think people sometimes reach a point where they emotionally ha- can't take it anymore. And I think David Hackworth got there where he had, had seen enough American soldiers and he loved, sol- he loved his soldiers and he loved all soldiers and he loved the army and just to see the soldiers being utilized in a way that he didn't think was tactically sound, eventually he just couldn't take it anymore. And I think that Major General Smedley Butler got to a a similar point. And of course this is 1935, so I mean we got Hitler in power in 1933, so he sees, he hears the war drums beating, and as he sees the war drums beating, he doesn't like it. What are your thoughts so far, Dave? It's interesting to hear you recount some things that I remember. Because obviously, as a Marine, this is one of the characters mm-hmm. in the history of the Marine Corps that you are are given early really? on. Yeah. So they give it. They give you Smedley Butler yeah. early on. Oh yeah. yeah. Is well, there is there not risk in that? Aren't they like? Well, yeah. The weird thing was the weird the Medal of Honors, right? I, look, I'm in no position to be like, well, I'm not sure, but. When 46 Navy sailors got a Medal of Honor and there's 17 killed in action, like that's a, that, that seems very, seems, that seems, that seems strange. Yeah. Right. For sure. Seems strange. And and that's the, 
that's really kind of the point that I'm thinking about in my mind is, you know, there's a little bit of a contrast. This is a guy that you you hear about. And certainly in, and listen, you could, I mean, I got to be careful with my words too, because I don't want there to be a negative connotation to it, but there's a, there's an indoctrination you go through when you're a Marine. Mm -hmm. And that indoctrination is, we're kind of awesome and our history is pretty awesome and we've got some amazing people that did some amazing things and you start to think about who those people are. One of the things that's interesting about the name Smedley Butler is when you see the pictures of this guy and like you'll be in a class and it'll be about Marine Corps history and they'll literally have a slide or a picture up on the wall of the person and he's not, he doesn't really look like a, mm-hmm. a I guess he looks like poster boy Marine. He looks like a guy named Smedley. He does. Right? And that went to a, maybe a private school on yeah. the East Coast. And, and then, you know, you're, you're seeing Baz alone and you're seeing Chesty in these pictures. And just the pictures alone are enough to be like, okay, this, this dude is legit. Um, but, you know, they also, I, I don't have any recollection of, of the things that he did and the times that he did them and the awards. I don't ever remember being given sort of the other side of it was, hey, listen, it was a different time, different circumstances. So as I hear you talk about that, and I'm listening to that, I just did some basic math, you know, 5,600 people, and then you sort of did the W, wounded and killed. I'm like, well, I've seen that. I know what the middle mm-hmm. or, or more of the other side of that looks like, and those numbers are good numbers. You know, by by, by standards, like you said, this is probably not the most high-intensity thing that 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 Marines have been through. But the other side is, is this is also, I mean, you just said he's 48 years old, he's a major general, this is a guy that went back in the Marine Corps twice, this is a guy that left high school, and by rights could have probably just coasted on a pretty easy life. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're kind of forced to reconcile in your mind that I, I think to maybe the whole point of this podcast is that I probably need to listen to what he has to say. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, he's he's he is one of the characters that, and I'm using that term just you know to illustrate that we are introduced to historic Marines that have have had impact in history, and that's someone that you, we know about for sure. We we could probably do a whole podcast about awards and whatnot, but I forget what year, like the Bronze Star and the Silver Star. It wasn't the, they didn't have those yet at this time? I yeah. don't think. And so this was if you were going to get an award, it was going to be the Medal of Honor. Um, and there you go. Again, it's it's like crazy because you got this guy that has two medal two medals of honor and this Marine Corps brevet thing, which there's there's not many of those things handed out either. It's it's a tiny number, and and also the type of combat that they were going into. I mean, this is pre World War One is yeah. the combat he's talking about. So combat was totally different between. Ah, uh, you know what? I mean, you got the Civil War. We knew what combat was, but but, um, yeah, there'd been a, there'd been a generation maybe that was a little bit that that hadn't quite been there. Yeah, and I think the sense that I've always had was that the when you think of conflict or you think of combat and you think of World War One, it has a very strong sense of organized conflict between two well established, well organized sides uh, sides that have design and structure and and components that you can almost align against each other and that per, certainly for world war one produces probably like the most heavy intensity of conflict mm-hmm. whereas before that you have this sense of this well-organized team the united states navy the united states marine corps the organization of those two working together where we're going to get you to the beach you're going to embark and you're going to or, or or debark and get onto the land and we're going to support you and but the 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 people you're in conflict with yeah. don't have that level of organization. Yeah. So when you said, um, you know, one wounded on the good side and 57 killed, I'm like, I can, mm. and again, I should be careful. W- but, wounded by a rock. But you can picture that like, this is a lopsided scenario. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that that weren't incredibly brave actions that didn't happen to solicit that outcome. But when you think of World War One and World War Two, or, or really conflicts we've had since then that organized versus organized, you don't get those sense of that long period of, of Marine Corps history. And those are all in Marine Corps history. We, mm-hmm. we learn about all those things. But you don't get a sense of this force-on-force conflict yeah. that we're the near peer, traditional. The yeah. near-peer um, World War One, World War Two. Yeah. we're going against someone that's pretty much like we are. Professionally trained, professionally outfitted, and prepared for, for this type of conflict. Check. So he writes his book, War is a Racket. And people, people, I, I don't know. I've had this book for five years. Um, in fact, I couldn't even find I have two copies of it. And I, have, I wasn't able to find them. So you can get this thing on PDF. Um, 
and the reason I couldn't find them is because the moving scenario <laughs> I'm going through. So all my books are in big giant boxes. And I was like, it's time to do it. And yeah, what, what makes it time to do it? Because, well, one of the things that just totally provoked me was a trillion dollar price tag on Afghanistan and thousands of lives lost. And you're thinking, hold on a second. Who, what was the, what was the overall goal here? Doing. Because if I sp- I could spend a trillion dollars and do literally anything, you give me a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars, you're telling me you couldn't square away a country with a trillion dollars in twenty years and basically an unlimited supply of people and and assets. It's crazy. So what was going on? So as I'm thinking about that, here I am, a guy that's that supports the military that is very patriotic and I'm thinking who spends a trillion dollars and and doesn't doesn't get the job done how does that happen who are you what are you thinking about what is your ultimate goal and that very quickly my mind very quick, quickly jumped on oh this is probably what smedley smedley but no I'd read wars a racket I was always kind of like yeah well yeah I mean that's one way of looking at it right so let's look at it Here we go, chapter one, war is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to be to the majority of the people. Only a small inside group knows what it's about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. Out of war, a few people make huge fortunes. Okay. If we're just gonna fact check this thing as we go, so far, we we are factual. Right, that's what a racket is. Right, a racket is something where a couple people kind of know what's going on. Everyone else is getting fooled. The couple people insiders are going to make a bunch of money. Other people are kind of going to get screwed. That's what's going to happen. In war, there are people that make a lot of money. He calls it the World War because there was only one at the time. In the World War, a mere handful garnered the profits of the conflict. At least 21,000 new millionaires and billionaires were made in the United States during the World War. That many admitted their huge blood gains, or sorry, that many admitted their huge blood gains in their income tax returns. How many other war millionaires falsified their tax returns? No one knows. Okay. So a lot of people made a lot of money in the war. I just saw an article that there's several billion dollars in taxes that are that are avoided by the top 1% earners in this country. So, are there people that are doing things to get around taxes? Yes. Were there people that were made into millionaires and billionaires after September 11th? Yes, there were. Next. How many of these war millionaires shouldered a rifle? How many of them dug a trench? How many of them knew what it meant to go hungry in a rat-infested dugout? How many of them spent sleepless, frightened nights ducking shells and shrapnel and machine gun bullets? How many of them parried a bayonet thrust of an enemy? How many of them were wounded or killed in battle? Rhetorical questions that I think we all know the answer to. Not many. Out of war, nations acquire additional territory. If they are victorious, they just take it. This newly acquired territory promptly is exploited by the few, the self-same few who wrung dollars out of blood in the war. The general public shoulders the bill fact check kind of negative on this one i mean america speaking of america we haven't 
we've we 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 kind of are established what we have territory wise and we haven't taken any new territory in recent wars that's not been our goal so and even you know the the idea that oh we're just going in there to take the oil we don't actually go in and take the oil it doesn't it hasn't happened and what is the bill this bill renders a horrible accounting newly placed gravestones mangled bodies shattered minds broken hearts and homes economic instability depression and all its attendant miseries back-breaking taxation for generations and generations factually true horrible accounting and taxation to pay for these wars for generations for a great many years as a soldier I had a suspicion that war was a racket not until I retired to civil life did I fully realize it now that I see the international war clouds gathering as they are today I must face it and speak out and again, that's because he's looking at World War II. What do you call them? The war clouds. Again, they are choosing sides. France and Russia met and agreed to stand by, side by side. Italy and Austria hurried to make a similar agreement. Poland and Germany cast, cast sheep's eyes at each other, forgetting for the nonce their dispute over the Polish corridor. I had to look at what nonce was. It means, uh, it means like a one-time, a one-time deal. Just, hey, we're just going to forget about our dispute over here because we're going to be friends right now. The assassination of King Alexander of Yugoslavia complicated matters. Yugoslavia and Hungary, Hungary, long, bitter enemies, were almost at each other's throats. Italy was ready to jump in, but France was waiting. So was Czechoslovakia. All of them are looking ahead to war. Not the people. Not those who fight and pay and die, only those who foment wars and remain safely at home to profit. What do you got? You gonna fact check that? No, 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 no. That's yeah. Yeah. Um. Um. I'm kind of sitting here listening to you talk, which is his work. Have words. you read this before? No, I have oh, not. Man. And so that's why this is like a. It's hard. This is hard. And so, I mean, I wrote down a bunch of different notes. The last one I just wrote down was was just literally the word angry. Like, and I don't, I don't think you're trying to convey that emotion on purpose. It's literally the words that you are reading. If you just, if you try to put yourself in his shoes, and I was just kind of recounting. We were talking about low intensity conflict and maybe the things that happened up until prior to World War One, and, and and I did think of something after I, I, I was talking a minute ago about you know the, the word low intensity conflict. I do remember the first time I was shot at, mm-hmm. like for real. Mm-hmm. And there's a moment when you're the one who, who is you know the victim or, or the potential victim here. It feels like World War Three because when you're the one <laughs> be, being shot, it doesn't really matter the scope of what's going around you. That sense of things like, oh damn, those people are there trying to kill me, and they're actually pretty darn close. Um, you don't say, well, you know, in the grand scheme of historical things, this is a very low intensity conflict, and this particular engagement isn't. You don't think like that. You think, okay, this is a big deal. This is a huge deal. And then, if you if you observe that, and, and, and you're in his shoes, and you lead up to 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 the travesty of World War One, mm-hmm. I'm just trying to be empathetic to the level of frustration you would have at the hands of. A few number of decision makers, both military and civilian, by the way, when we talked about World War One, it's not hard for me to try to understand that as he said, I'm just almost picturing him writing this down and just the just the frustration and the anger that he has and how clearly that's coming through and hearing you say his the words that he's saying, um, that it's hard not to to get a sense of his frustration. And, and you've even talked about with Hackworth is that when you just kind of boil over, you're not able to really even articulate yourself, I don't mean to say correctly, but but the way that you would normally want to when you can keep your emotions in, in check, yeah. which you can't. Yeah, and I know you got a, you found it very interesting when we did, when we talked about B.H. Liddell Hart 
just the fact like once you realized he was in the Battle of the Somme, you're like, Oh got it. Okay. So this guy has a totally different perspective, which is completely grounded and and fermented in what he experienced on the battlefield. And yeah. This is a uh, yeah. It's definitely it's definitely a similar a similar deal. Moving on, there are 40 million men under arms in the world today. So this again, this is 1935. And our statesmen and diplomats have the temerity to say that war is not in the making. Hell's bells. Are these 40 million men being trained to be dancers? (laughs) Not in Italy, to be sure. Premier Mussolini knows what they are being trained for. He, at least, is frank enough to speak out. Only the other day, Il Duce, in International Conciliation, the publication of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace said, quote, and above all, fascism, the more it considers and observes the future and the development of humanity quite apart from political considerations of the moment, believes neither in the possibility nor the utility of perpetual peace. War alone brings up to its highest tension all human energy and puts the stamp of nobility upon the people who have the courage to meet it, end quote. That's a, (laughs) it's one thing for Ronald Reagan to say peace through strength and hey, we've got to be strong and we've got to, you know, the best way to to avoid war is to be prepared for it. (laughs) But when you got Mussolini just saying, hey, there's, I don't believe in the possibility or the, or the freaking Utility. utility of peace. Yeah. War alone brings to its highest tension all human energy and puts the stamp of nobility upon the people who have the courage to meet it, that's the leader of your country, guess what's happening? You're going to You're war. You're going to war. <laughs> Undoubtedly, Mussolini means exactly what he says. His well-trained army, his great fleet of planes, and even his navy are ready for war, anxious for it, apparently. His recent stand at the side of Hungary in the latter's dispute with Yugoslavia showed that, and the hurried mobilization of troops on the Austrian border after the assassination of Dolphus showed it too. There are others in Europe whose saber rattling presages war sooner or later. Herr Hitler, with his rearming Germany and his constant demands for more and more arms is an equal if not greater menace to peace. France only recently increased the term of military service for its youth from a year to 18 months. All this stuff is going on, he's just tracking it. He sees everybody's just heading to war. Yes, all over, nations are camping in their arms. The mad dogs of Europe are on the loose. In the Orient, the maneuvering is more adroit. Back in 1904, when Russia and Japan fought, we kicked our old friends, the Russians, and back Japan. Then our very generous international bankers were financing Japan. Now the trend is to poison us against the Japanese. What does the open door policy to China mean to us? Our trade with China is about $90 million a year. Or the Philippine Islands. We have spent about $600 million in the Philippines in 35 years. And we, our bankers and industrialists and speculators, have private investments there of less than $200 million. Then, to save China, to save that China trade of about 90 million and to protect these private investments of less than 200 in the Philippines, we would all be stirred up to hate Japan and go to war. A war that might well cost us tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of American lives, and many more hundreds of thousands of physically maimed and mentally unbalanced men. Of course, for this loss, there would be a compensating profit. Fortunes would be made. Millions and billions of dollars would be piled up by a few. Munitions makers, bankers, shipbuilders, manufacturers, meat packers, speculators, they would fare well. Yes, they are getting ready for another war. Why shouldn't they? It pays high dividends. But what? does it profit the men who are killed? What does it profit their mothers and sisters, their wives and their sweethearts? What does it profit their children? What does it profit anyone except the very few to whom war means huge profits? Yes, and what does it profit the nation? 
So, <clears throat> I kind of have my thoughts on all this that I'm going to save a little bit. Um, but what's 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 the the I would say the methodology of the argument that he's presenting is to show one side of the argument, which is very, it's a good, it's a good argument. I mean, you can't you can't really you can't really come at this argument. You can't say, well, people aren't going to make money. No, people make money. That's what happens. Yeah. And that by itself isn't automatically a bad thing either. This is true. Yeah. That's the other. That's the other part. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like right, there's, I'll, I'll, there's, I there's, know you've got thoughts on this too, and I got to be careful. I could probably chime in like I usually do on every single thing that's said. <laughs> and there's a thoughts going through my head like crazy. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there are profiteers and there are people that profit. And and if I'm using the terms correctly, you can distinguish between those two. Right. And they can be aligned. For sure. I mean, it's easy for me to sit here in retrospect, but it's like, hey, Hitler, Mussolini. Yeah, we probably want to go to all of those people. Yeah. Now, not yeah. let them do what they want. That's not a good plan. And yes. I know this now, sitting here looking back. But you're right. And and I think to your point, his perspective is correct. It's not the whole story, right. but it's a perspective that what that, he sees and the way he's presenting it is correct. Yes. It's just that there is more to There's it. There's more to it. And and as you said, there's nothing more obvious than that than a guy named Adolf Hitler. Right. That's about to go on a tear yeah. and kill millions of people. And it's interesting. He's using him like, hey, he might be worse than this other guy. Like, yeah, he might be. <laughs> yeah, 1935. <laughs> he didn't seem so bad compared to Mussolini. He's going to give a little example here. Take our own case. Until, until 1898, we didn't own a bit of territory outside the mainland of North America. At that time, our national debt was little more than a billion dollars. Then we became internationally minded. We forgot or shunned to decide the advice of the father of our country. We forgot George Washington's warning about entangling alliances. We went to war. We acquired outside territory at the end of the World War period. As a direct result of our fiddling in international affairs, our national debt had jumped to over $25 billion. Our total favorable trade balance during the 25-year period was about $24 billion. Therefore, on a purely bookkeeping basis, we ran a little behind year for year, and that foreign trade might as well have been ours without the wars. Again, when you just look at the numbers, run the numbers, man, we're, we were a billion dollars in that debt, and now we're $25 billion in debt. That hurts. It would have been far cheaper not to say safer, for the average American who pays the bills to stay out of forward entanglements. For a very few, this racket, like bootlegging and other underworld rackets, brings fancy profits, but the cost of operations is always transferred to the people who do not profit. And now we get into chapter two, who makes the profits? The World War, rather our brief participation in it, has cost the United States some 52 billion dollars figured out that means four hundred dollars to every american man woman and child and we haven't paid the debt yet we are paying it our children will pay it and our children's children probably still will be paying the cost of that war the normal profits of a business concern in the united states are six eight ten and sometimes twelve percent but wartime profits ah that is another matter 20, 60, 100, 300, and even 1,800%. The sky is the limit. All that traffic will bear. Uncle Sam has the money. Let's get it. Of course, it isn't put that crudely in wartime. It is dressed into speeches about patriotism, love of country, and, quote, we must all put our shoulders to the wheel. But the prophets jump and leap and skyrocket and are safely pocketed. Let's just take a few examples. Take our friends, the DuPonts, the powder people. Didn't one of them testify before a Senate committee recently that their powder won the war or saved the world or saved the world for democracy or something? How did they do in the war? They were a patriotic corporation. Well, the average earnings of the DuPonts for the period of 1910 to 1914 was $6 million a year. It wasn't much, but the DuPonts managed to get along. 
Now let's look at their average yearly profit during the war years, 1914 to 1918. $58 million of profit a year, we find. Nearly 10 times that of normal times, and the profits of normal times were pretty good. An increase of profits more than 950%. Take one of our little steel companies that patriotically shunted aside the making of rails and girders and bridges to manufacture war materials. Well, their 1910 to 1914 yearly earnings averaged $6 million, then came the war. And like loyal citizens, Bethlehem Steel promptly turned to mission, munitions making. Did their profits jump or did, they let, or did they let Uncle Sam in for a bargain? Well, their 1914 to 1918 average was $49 million a year. Or let's take United Steel. Normal earnings during the five-year period prior to the war were $105 million a year. Not bad. Then came along the war and up went the profits. The average yearly profit for the period 1914 to 1918 was $240 million. Not bad. Then you have a, some of the steel and powder earnings. Let's look, at some, let's look at something else. A little copper, perhaps. That always does well in war times. Anaconda, for instance. Average yearly earnings during the pre-year, pre-year wars of 1910 to 1914, $10 million. During the war, war years, 1914 to 1918, profits leapt to $34 million a year. Utah copper, average of $5 million during the pre-war period, jumped to an average of $21 million yearly profits for the war, war period. Let's group these five with three similar companies. The total yearly average profits of the pre-war period, 1910 to 1914, were $137 million. Then came along the war, the average yearly profits for this group skyrocketed to 408 million. A little increase in profits of approximately 200%. Does war pay? It paid them. But they aren't the only ones, there are still others. Let's take leather. For a three year period, before the war, the total profits of Central Leather Company were at 3.5 million. That was approximately $1.16 million a year. Well, in 1916, Central Leather returned a profit of $15 million, a small, small increase of 1,100%. That's all. A general chemical, the General Chemical Company averaged a profit for three years before the war of a little over $800,000 a year. Came the war and profits jumped to $12 million a year, a leap of 1,400%. International Nickel Company, you can't have a war without nickel, showed an increase in profits from a mere $4 million a year to $73 million a year. Not bad, an increase of 1,700%. American Sugar Refining Company averaged $2 million a year for three years before the war in 1916, a profit of $6 million was recorded. Listen to Senate document number 259, the 65th Congress, Congress reporting on corporate earnings and government revenues. Considering the profits of 122 meat packers, 153 cotton manufacturers, 299 garment makers, 49 steel plants, 340 coal producers during the war. Profits under 25% were exceptional. For instance, the coal companies made between 100% and 7,800% on their capital stock during the war. The Chicago Packers doubled and tripled their earnings. Let us not forget the bankers who financed the Great War. If anyone cream, if anyone had the cream of the profits, it was the bankers. Being partnerships rather than incorporated organizations, they do not have to report to stockholders, and their profits were as secret as they were immense. How the bankers made their millions and billions, I do not know, because those little secrets never become public even before a Senate investigatory body. People make money. I mean, and part of that is supply and demand. And one of the reasons that America does so well during war is because we have capitalism, and that's how we're able to outproduce other countries, even I mean, especially companies that have socialized or communist controlled uh, industry. They just can't do what we do. Why? Because they're not driven to do it. There's no, hey, uh, look, I, I'm running this factory for whatever, for the Soviet Union. They want me to make 100 tanks. They want me to make 200 tanks. I, I'm going to get the same paycheck regardless. And if I'm a guy, whatever, working on the the, the, the fabrication of one of those tank treads, I don't care if I make 20 today or if I make 100 today. I, I, I'm gonna get the same paycheck. So these people are gonna make a lot of money because they're gonna turn out something that is in high demand. 
<clears throat> Here's how some other patriotic industrialists and speculators chiseled their way into war profits. Take the shoe people. They like war. It brings business with abnormal profits. They made huge profits and sales abroad to our allies. Perhaps, like the munitions manufacturers and armor, armor makers, they also sold to the enemy. For a dollar is a dollar, whether it comes from Germany or from France. But they did well by Uncle Sam, too. For instance, they sold Uncle Sam 35 million pairs of hobnailed service shoes. So that's a big number. <laughs> there were four million sol- soldiers, eight pairs or more to a soldier. My regiment during the war had only one pair to soldier, per soldier. Some of these shoes probably are still in existence. They were good shoes. But when the war was over, Uncle Sam has a matter of 25 million pairs of shoes left over, bought and paid for, profits recorded and, pro- and pocketed. And this is, you know, you should start getting into the idea of just like the government waste and it's just the crazy, crazy government waste. Which is why the free market is so powerful. Because people try and streamline things. There was a lot of leather left, so the leather people sold your Uncle Sam hundreds of thousands of McClellan saddles for the cavalry. But there wasn't any American cavalry overseas. Somebody had to get rid of this leather, however. Somebody had to make a profit in it, so we had a lot of McClellan saddles. We probably still do. Also, somebody made a lot of mosquito netting. They sold Uncle Sam 20 million mosquito nets for the use of soldiers overseas. I suppose the boys were expected to put it over them as they tried to sleep in muddy trenches. One hand scratching cooties on their backs and the others making passes at scurrying rats. Well, not one of these mosquito nets ever got to France. Anyhow, these thoughtful manufacturers wanted to make sure that no soldier would be without his mosquito net. So 40 million additional yards of mosquito netting were sold to Uncle Sam. You know why? Because you're not spending your own money. You're not spending your own money. When you're not spending your own money, man, you spend it on stuff. Because it's really easy to, you know what, they might need them. Mm. Hey, you know what, let's get them. And all politics are loco. And who knows who was putting in those, where those mosquito nets were made. These were pretty good profits in mosquito netting in those days, even if there were no mosquitoes in France. I suppose if the war had lasted just a little bit longer, the enterprising mosquito netting manufacturers would have sold Uncle Sam a couple of consignments of mosquitoes to plant in France so that more mosquito netting would be in order. Airplane and air and engine manufacturers felt they too should adjust their profits out of this war. Why not? Everybody else is getting theirs. So a billion dollars, count them if you live long enough, was spent by Uncle Sam in building airplane engines that never left the ground. Not one plane or motor out of the billion dollars worth ordered ever got into battle in France. Just the same, the manufacturers made their little profit of 30, 100, or perhaps 300%. Remember the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline? <laughs> Apparently they didn't have that. Like in the military, yeah. Echo Charles, they got a thing called the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline. Yeah. You can call up and say, hey, we're buying plane engines. <laughs> we got them lined up. Yeah. We're not using them. We're buying mosquito nets. We're not using them. Did anyone actually use that? Or do you know of anyone who, who used it? I never that? used it. Did you ever use it, Dave? I never use it, but I know the sticker on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. If I would have had to use it, I probably would have used it on my tasking or my platoon for the money we were wasting on ammunition. <laughs> Just slaying ammunition. <sighs> Undershirts for soldiers cost 14 cents to make. And Uncle Sam paid 30 to 40 cents each for them. A nice little profit for the undershirt manufacturer and the stocking manufacturer and the uniform manufacturers and the cap manufacturer and the steel helmet manufacturers all got theirs. Why, when the war was over, some four million sets of equipment, knapsacks and the things that go to fill them, crammed warehouses on this side. Now they are being scrapped because the regulations have changed the contents. But the manufacturers collected their wartime profits on them and they will do it all over again next time. There were lots of brilliant ideas for making profit during the war. One very versatile patriot sold Uncle Sam 12 dozen 48 inch wrenches. Oh, they were very nice wrenches. The only trouble was that there was only one nut ever made that was large enough for these wrenches. That's the one that holds the turbines at Niagara Falls. Well, after Uncle Sam had bought them and manufactured, and the manufacturer had profited from them, the wrenches were put on freight cars and shunted all around the United States in, in an effort to find a use for them. When the armistice was signed, it was indeed a sad blow to the wrench manufacturer. He was just about to make some nuts to fit the wrenches. Then he planned to sell those two to your Uncle Sam. 
Still another brilliant idea that the colonels shouldn't ride in automobiles, nor should they even ride on horseback. One has probably seen a picture of Andy Jackson riding on a buckboard. Well, some 6,000 buckboards were sold to Uncle Sam for the use by colonels. Not one of them was used. The buckboard manufacturer got his war profit. Buckboard is like a wagon. It's like a carriage with leaf springs to be towed behind a horse. 6,000 of them. The shipbuilders felt they should come on on some of it too. They built a lot of ships that made a lot of profit, more than $3 billion worth. Some of the ships were all right, but $635 million worth of them were made of wood that wouldn't float. The seams opened up and they sank. We paid for them though, and somebody pocketed the profits. It's been estimated by statisticians and economists and researchers that the war cost your Uncle Sam $52 billion. Of this sum, $39 billion was expended in the actual war itself. This expenditure yielded $16 billion in profits. That is how the 21,000 billionaires and millionaires got that way. This $16 billion in profits is not to be sneezed at. It's quite a tidy sum, and it went to a very few. The Senate Committee probe of the munitions industry and its wartime profits, despite its sensational closers, hardly had scratched the surface. Even so, it's had some effect. The State Department had been studying for some time methods of keeping out of war. The War Department suddenly decides it has a wonderful plan to spring. The administration names a committee with the War Navy Departments ably represented under the chairmanship of a Wall Street speculator to limit profits in wartime. To what extent isn't suggested? Hmm. Possibly the profits of 300 and 600 and 1600 percent of those who turned blood into gold in World War in the World War would be limited to some smaller figure. Apparently, however, the plan does not call for any limitation of losses. That is the loss losses of those who fight the war. As far as I have been able to ascertain, there is nothing in this scheme to limit a soldier to the loss of but one eye or one arm or to limit his wounds to one or two or three or to limit the loss of life. There's nothing in this scheme, apparently, that says not more than 12% of a regiment shall be wounded in bottle or not more than 7% of a division shall be killed. Of course, the committee cannot be bothered with such trifling matters. So they put together a committee and say, well, you know, they're making a little too much money. We should put a limit on how much money they can make. Possibly limit those war profits. (sighs) Chapter three, who pays the bills? Who provides the profits, these nice little profits of 20, 100, 300, 1500, 1800%. We all pay them in taxation. We paid the bankers their profits when we bought Liberty Bonds at $100 and sold them back at 84 or 86 to the bankers. These bankers collected $100 plus. It was a simple manipulation. The bankers controlled the security markets. It was easy for them to depress the price of these bonds. Then all of us, the people, got frightened and sold the bonds at 84 or 86. The bankers bought them. Then these same bankers stimulated a boom and government bonds went to par and above, and then the bankers collected their profits. But the soldier pays the biggest part of the bill. If you don't believe this, visit the American cemeteries on the battlefields abroad, or visit any of the veterans' hospitals in the United States. On a tour of the country, in the midst of which I am I am doing at the time of writing this, I have visited 18 government hospitals for veterans. In them are a total of about 50,000 destroyed men, men who were the pick of the nation 18 years ago. The very able chief surgeon at the government hospital at Milwaukee, where there are 3,800 of the living dead, told me that mortality among veterans is three times as great as among those who stayed at home. So this was interesting because we, we, we hear a lot about what happens when we come home. We hear about PTSD. And you, you see like the images of shell shock in World War II, especially in England and the Brits. You don't hear a lot about it from World War I. And 
this this is a weirdly written sentence. I tried to read it in a way that made it made sense, but it says the very able surgeon, the very able chief surgeon at the government hospital, semicolon, at Milwaukee, where there are 3,800 of the living dead, told me that the mortality among veterans is three times as great as among those who stayed at home. So what he's saying is people that fought are three times likely to die, three times more likely to die than someone that didn't fight. Doesn't talk about how, but my guess is a lot of those are suicide. Or just like the crazy violent deaths that military people that have that experience end up having. And here he goes into it a little bit in the most simplistic and so obvious way. Boys with a normal viewpoint were taken out of the fields and offices and factories and classrooms and put into the ranks. They were remolded. They were made over. They were made to about face, to regard murder as the order of the day. They were put shoulder to shoulder and through mass psychology, they were entirely changed. We used them for a couple of years and trained them to think nothing at all of killing or of being killed. Then, suddenly, we discharged them and told them to make another about face. This time they had to do their own readjustment without mass psychology, without officers' aid and advice, and without nationwide propaganda. We didn't need them anymore. So we scattered them about with any three-minute or liberty loan speeches, or without any three-minute or liberty loan speeches or parades. Many, too many of these fine young boys are eventually destroyed mentally because they could not make that final about face alone. That's pretty straightforward. And he gives an example here. He says, in the government hospital in Marion, Indiana, 1,800 of these boys are in pens. 500 of them in a barracks with steel bars and wires all around the outside of the buildings and on the porches. These already have been mentally destroyed. These boys don't even look like human beings. Oh, the look on their faces. Physically, they are in good shape. Mentally, they are gone. There are thousands and thousands of these cases, and more and more are coming in all the time. The tremendous excitement of the war, the sudden cutting off of that excitement, the young boys couldn't stand it. I'm going to have to dig into that. I'm going to have to get some research going on that because that sounds horrific. Eighteen hundred, got eighteen hundred men, boys. He's calling them, but but this is 1935. You know, the, the war ended in 1918, so he's, these are young men, and you just don't hear about this. You hear about it now. You don't hear about it from World War One. And in fact, World War II, I've talked about like, well, you know, in World War II, you got to come home on a ship with some other guys and you got to decompress for five or six weeks and you you were held up as a hero and all this stuff and that's why it was easier to adapt. It's like, oh, what about World War I? And that freaking psychotic war. Yeah, I mean, everything that's in my mind obviously has to be tempered with the fact that I truly cannot claim to appreciate the reality that he's describing. He, he, he said he's been, to, basically talking about VA hospitals. He's been to 18 different VA hospitals. He's, this is a passion for him. He's going around seeing what's going on. And it, at least in the sense of, of when you think about World War II, that there was this, and I, I got to assume it was felt at the time, this very clear sense of good and evil, right and wrong, and the sides that we are on, and the the the, the justification 
and the necessity, the global necessity. And if you think about World War One, to at least try to reconcile the loss and what was it for and what was really at stake and how much blurry or not, just when you, you don't feel that in World War One. And, and you talk about probably a nation that's just totally ill-equipped to have a 25-year-old come back after seeing what they saw without even being able to say, hey, I at least saved the world, you know, from Holocaust or nuclear war, or whatever could have been at stake by the end of World War II, and being totally ill-equipped to know how to even handle that. At least in modern times, right? You're at least a little bit desensitized, right? You've seen horror movies. You've seen blood and guts. You're playing first person shooter video games like this is can you imagine coming from freaking omaha nebraska where you're like going to school you're you, you know i mean you're just a a normal kid uh, that might not even be the best example because at least in omaha nebraska you're you're slaughtering pigs you're shooting guns, you're shooting yeah. guns. Yeah. but if you're in whatever if you're from the city and you just you're just not around that you're not seeing it and then boom you're thrown into world war one yeah and there was another section that he that uh, that I know about Smedley Butler. There was a point I think it was when he was in China where he for the first time saw like mass slaughtered Japanese, and, and it's just one of those points that he had seen some real violence, and that was before World War One. But yeah, at least nowadays, this might be a bad thing, is that people are desensitized somewhat. You, you know, go on, go on. Um, whatever YouTube, I don't know. Does YouTube filter out like uh, heinous shootings and stuff like that? Yeah. So where do you see stuff like that now? <clears throat> oddly, and I don't want to go too deep into it, but oddly, they had a few websites out there that you could just go. You yeah. Know, it, they they say click here, make sure you're 18, whatever. Yeah. And then you can watch whatever sick video you want. But as I've noticed, not that I frequent these things, but mm. as I've noticed, they've been kind of disappearing. Yeah, that's interesting. Like I remember there was a video of a of a a Russian soldier being yeah. killed by a by a Chechen, yeah. and it's brutal. They're putting his boot on his head, and they're just yeah. he's screaming, and they're cutting his throat, and he's sort of like slowly yeah. the impact of the knife blade. Yeah, that's old school. There's way worse stuff. I'm saying now. that's old school, yeah. but I haven't seen that in a long time. Yeah. And but I'm sure there's like some websites where you can just see all that stuff. Yeah, and I like I said, I think they're kind of quietly doing away with them. Maybe because they encourage certain like mm-hmm. groups to be like, oh, let's see if we can put ours up, you know, because in that dark area of mm-hmm. the Internet, it's like the people who are responsible for making those videos. Um, sometimes they get into these little competitions to see who, who can make the sickest video. Well, and they go hard for sure. Even if you just saw rated R movies, yeah, you would be more accustomed to this kind of scenery oh yeah right? and and you got you have like like yeah the exposure of what war actually is is way more now compared yeah. to yeah, that yeah, yeah. time like, like that hey know? if you watched um saving private ryan yeah, you, oh, yeah. you're like okay man i mean this is oh yeah and there's reports plenty of reports that world war ii veterans that were at d-day were totally thought you know thought that nailed it mm-hmm. and they were very disturbed in watching it oh, yeah. and and had to take a break had to walk out whatever because it was so realistic oh, yeah. so that's going to condition you yeah. But if you leave freaking Maryland where you live in a small neighborhood and your dad works at the factory and next thing you know you're in World War 1. Yeah. And then and then all of a sudden 3 weeks later you're back back in Maryland. Yeah. In your neighborhood. Yeah, you it's going to be a rough one. That's a good way to put it. I was like, "Hey, they take you out of your normal world." And make you do an about face with yeah, all this essential training and yeah. like all this cook, you know, this influence and stuff. And then when that's done, just all of a sudden, hey, do another about face, but hey, do it on your own kind of a thing. It's like, mm-hmm. dang, that's exactly what happens, huh? You know that song by the White Buffalo that he played when he was on here? It's called "Wish It Was True." Yeah. Well, when he was on here, he played that song, and and I actually had like asked him to play. Yeah, that the song. slow one. Yeah, and um, but. The song, you know, it's got a line in there that basically says, hey, you're just a number and we, mm-hmm. we used you and you're through. Mm-hmm. And there's a couple of people that, you know, left some comments or hit me up like, this is an anti-war song. What are you talking about? And I was like, hey, bro, 
This is what happens. Yeah. It doesn't happen all the time, but this is a this is a song written from someone's individual viewpoint of hey, went to war, whatever war it was, maybe it was World War One, World War Two, World War uh, Korea, Vietnam. There was plenty of people that went to those wars, came home, and this is exactly what happened. That's what that song is about. Yeah. It's not saying oh, you you just got used by the, every single soldier. It's not saying that, yeah. but there this happens. This does happen, and that's why it's such a powerful song. This might sound a little bit insensitive, but you know, you know, Rambo. That's what yep. that story was essentially about. When it you, is when you watch First Blood, yep. right? Like that's essentially what it was that's about. That's what it's about. And then they, then they, of course, they do him dirty again, send him to jail. And then Rambo two, they're like, oh wait, wait, we need that guy again. You know, let's go mm-hmm. get that guy. And then that, they do him, try to do him dirty again. See what I'm saying? That is essentially the story. Yep. And it's not. And and look, there's plenty of people that come home from war and they get, they they're able to deal with it. Yeah. And they go, cool, you know what? I, I did what I had to do, and now I'm going back to the work, and I'm going back to the factory, I'm going back to the construction site, going back to the to the insurance business that I'm running or that I work at. Like it's people, people do, and they also saw different things. What did this person see? They'll do different things. What did this person do? So we gotta take all these things into account. But like you just pointed out, Echo, the fact that you're gonna take hundreds of thousands of people, in World War One, in World War Two, you're gonna take hundreds of thousands of people and train them to kill. And then when it's over, you're like, cool, we're good. Hey, appreciate it, yeah. see you later. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I don't, I, uh, Eugene Sledge, I mean, he had a really hard time when he came home from war. A really hard time when he came home from war. And he still carried on with his normal life. I mean, actually all those guys did. Yeah. Um, all those guys that were over, over there had a real hard time. But there's also m- millions of veterans that came home and like, they carried on with their life. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I, I mean, I've had had them on this podcast. I mean, Charlie Plum. How, how does he come home from six years of captivity and it's just like, okay, cool. Well, you know, do, you know, we're gonna move on. Yeah. William Reader. By the way, William Reader, forty years, like stayed in the army for another whatever, thirty eight years, <laughs> doing his job, getting a fit rep. How do you write a fit rep for for William Reader? How do you not just say, hey, sir, what? Look, <laughs> I'm supposed to be in charge of you. You tell me what you want to do. Because you have done more than for the military than I could have ever hoped to have done, and I appreciate you sitting here and not like, not like beating me up or whatever, <laughs> not not counseling me on what an idiot I am. So there's plenty of people that come home and they they are now. I will say this, and Charlie Plum pointed this out to me. There, the amount of like post-traumatic stress that the guys that were in the Hanoi Hilton had was less on average than normal infantrymen. And it's because they had this camaraderie. At least that's what he said. At least I think I remember what he said. But but they had this camaraderie, so it was like, hey, you know, we were all, and they had time to process it, and, and then they got this huge, beautiful welcome home. And I mean, when I, uh, it was Jim Searlesley. I think it was Jim Searlesley when he, you know, he's, lost both legs and his arm, and the guys came home from being POWs with the white, you know, with the big reception. And he was like, hey, bro. <laughs> uh, I understand you guys were held captive. I'm sorry. Um, you know, I, I got back and just went to a freaking rehab for nine months, and then I'm out here with one arm. So I, that probably helped the, the guys that were captive captives in, in, in Vietnam as well is that they got a very warm welcome home. And as we know, a lot of Vietnam veterans did not get a warm welcome home. And I, from what it sounds like here, same thing, World War I. Oh, the look on their faces. Physically, they're in good shape. Mentally, they are gone. Yeah. I wrote that down too. That, that the metaphor that he describes about we take them, we have them do an about face. And then we have them doing another about face, and it's they can't do that second one. We have them do the second one on their own. On their own, and they can't do it. it it's not unreasonable to think, and just I was literally just thinking about what, what, who, who are you if you're a 21, 22 year old male in nineteen fourteen going to World War One? Who, who are you? And, and it's, it's not unreasonable to think that they had no idea what war was. Period. What war was. And if you think about today, like joining the military, to your point, at least 
some exposure is accessible to anybody, you have some idea what yeah. war is. You've seen Platoon, you've seen yes. Full Metal Jacket, you've seen Saving Private Ryan, you've seen Apocalypse Now, you've seen all these movies. Yes, and, and it's in the national psyche too. People are talking about it. People yeah. have been talking about it. Mm-hmm. If you were in World War One and you're 20, I mean the last, I, yeah, there's historians that probably do some math, but like, this, unless you have some connection to the Civil War, which ended 50 years ago, and you're getting stories from your grandpa, you have no idea what war is. And then you're going to World War I, where the use of human capital, the, the use of a human being was, was less significant than, than any other piece of material that was out there. And, and today, like... I. I I did 23 years in the Marine Corps and I retired like five years ago. It's like 30 years coming up on my military experience. We take excessive, sometimes tactically unsound lengths to preserve American lives. Now, obviously we know that doesn't always work out, but we don't by design waste lives. And you can kind of almost count on that. Like, hey, there, there are no more human waves. There's no more, hey, listen, gents, have a seat. Let's talk about this plan. We know we're all going to get wiped out, but we have to go do this. Like those conversations aren't really happening. And so you kind of know what you're getting into a little bit, at least softens out a little bit. You know what war is, some idea what the war is going to be like. I can't imagine a bigger contrast of being 19 years old. Hey, you're going to Europe. I'm like, hey, where is that? <laughs> okay, cool. It's here. Yeah. Hey, what country is that? That's this country here. Okay, who are we fighting? Uh, these people over here. Oh, how is this going to work? Well, when you get there, we'll show you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. And that, and then and then you see World War One. Yeah. The second about face to do on your own. Yeah, it's gonna be a rough it's one. It's not gonna work out, right? It's and he's now touring one. the country going, Yeah. And and yeah, the frustration is should we probably take a couple of those dollars? I mean the sarcasm with, with just mm. the he's so should we take a couple of those dollars and maybe help these folks with that about face? These patriots over here making money. Again, and this is just me saying I can appreciate this point of view. Get where he's coming. I get from. where he's coming from. And this is this is not some coward. This is not some. Um, this is not a dude who's sitting on the sidelines casting judgment. This is a guy who who for whatever got back in the. This is a guy who yep. can speak, you know, yep. from a first person point of view. He certainly can. So he gets done talking about that part of the bill, and he says that's a part of the bill. So much for the dead, they have paid their part of the war profits. So much for the mentally and physically wounded, they are paying now for their share of the war profits. But others paid too. They paid with heartbreaks when they tore themselves away from their firesides and their families to don the uniform of Uncle Sam, on which a profit had been made. They paid another part in the training camps where they were regimented and drilled while others took their jobs and their places in their lives and in their communities. They paid for it in the trenches where they were shot at and they were shot, where they were hungry for days at a time, where they slept in mud and cold and rain with the moans and shrieks of the dying for a horrible lullaby. But don't forget, the soldier paid part of the dollars and cents bill too. Up to and including the Spanish-American War, we had a prize system, and soldiers and sailors fought for money. During the Civil War, they were paid bonuses, in many instances, before they went into service. The government or the states paid as high as $1,200 for an enlistment. In the Spanish-American War, they gave prize money. When we captured any vessels, the soldiers all got their share. At least they were supposed to. Then it was found we could reduce the cost of wars by taking all the prize money and keeping it, but conscripting the soldiers anyway, so just going to the draft. Then soldiers couldn't bargain for their labor either. Everyone else could bargain, but the soldier couldn't. Napoleon once said, all men are enamored of decorations. They positively hunger for them. So by developing a Napoleonic system, the metal business, the government learned it could get soldiers for less money because the boys liked to be decorated. Until the Civil War, there were no medals. Then the Congressional Medal of Honor was handed out. It made enlistments easier. After the Civil War, no new medals were issued until the Spanish-American War. In the World War, we used propaganda to make the boys accept conscription. 
They were made to feel ashamed if they didn't join the army. So vicious was this war propaganda that even God was brought into it. With, a few, with few exceptions, our clergymen joined the, in the clamor to kill, 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 to kill the Germans. God is on our side. It is his will that the Germans should be killed. And in Germany, the good pastors called upon the Germans to kill the allies, to please the same God. That was part of the general propaganda built up to make people war conscious and murder conscious. Beautiful ideals were painted for our boys who were sent out to die. This was the war to end all wars. This was the war to make the world safe for democracy. No one mentioned to them as they marched away that their going and dying would mean huge war profits. No one told these American soldiers that they might be shot down by bullets made by their own brothers here. No one told them that the ships on which they were going to cross might be torpedoed by submarines built with United States patents. They were just told it was going to be a glorious adventure. Thus, having stuffed patriotism down their throats, it was decided to make them help pay for the war too. So we gave them a large salary of $30 a month. All they had to do for this magnificent sum was to leave their dear ones behind, give up their jobs, lie in swampy trenches, eat canned willy when they could get it, and kill and kill and kill and be killed. But wait, half that wage just a little more than a riveter in a shipyard or a laborer in a munitions factory safe at home made in a day, half that wage was promptly taken from him to support his dependents so that he would not become a charge upon his community. Then we made him pay what amounted to accident insurance, something the employer pays for in an enlightened state. And that cost him about $6 a month. He had less than $9 a month left. Then the most crowning insolence of all, he was virtually blackjacked into paying for his own ammunition, clothing, and food by being, ma- by being made to buy liberty bonds. Most soldiers got no money at all on paydays. We made them buy back, we made them buy liberty bonds for $100, and then we bought them back when they came back from the war and couldn't find work at $84 and $86. And the soldiers brought a, bought about $2 billion worth of these bonds. Yes, the soldier pays the greater part of the bill his family pays too. They paid in the same heartbreak that he does. As he suffers, they suffer. At nights, as he lay in the trenches and watched shrapnel burst about him, they lay home in their beds and toss sleeplessly. His father, his mother, his wife, his sisters, his brothers, his sons, and his daughters. When he returned home minus an eye or minus a leg or with his mind broken, they suffered too. As much and sometimes even more than he. Yes, and they too contributed their dollars to the profits of the munition makers and bankers and shipbuilders and the manufacturers and the speculators made. They too bought liberty bonds and contributed to the profit of the bankers after the armistice in the hocus pocus of manipulated liberty bond prices. And even now, the families of the wounded men and of the mentally broken and those who were never able to readjust themselves are still suffering and paying. <clears throat> Fact check. I'm going to go ahead and say truth. That's what's going on. <clears throat> Chapter four. How to smash this racket. Well, it's a racket, all right. A few profit and the many pay. But there is a way to stop it. You can't end it by a disarmament conference. You can't eliminate it by peace parlays at Geneva. Well-meaning but impractical groups can't wipe it out by resolutions. It can be smashed effectively only by taking the profit out of war. The only way to smash this racket is to conscript capital and industry and labor before nations' manhood can be conscripted. And there's just an interesting thing I got to point out. When he talks about capital, industry, and labor, he's talking about those groups of people. And I'm not going to change. It would be saying like the capitalists and the industrialists and the and the labor force. You you could say that, but that's what he. Those the words he uses is capital industry. He's talking about those people. One month before the government can conscript the young men of the nation, it must conscript capital and industry and labor. 
Let the officers and the directors and the high-powered executives of our armament factories and munition makers and our shipbuilders and airplane builders and the manufacturers of all other things that provide profit in wartime, as well as the bankers and the speculators, be conscripted to get $30 a month the same wage as the lads in the trenches get. Let the workers in these plants get the same wages. All the workers, all presidents, all executives, all directors, all managers, all bankers, yes, and all generals and admirals and officers and all politicians and all government officer, office holders, everyone in the nation can be restricted to a total monthly income not to, be, not to exceed that paid to the soldier in the trenches. Let all these kings and tycoons and masters of business and all those workers in industry and all our senators and governors and majors pay half of their monthly $30 wage to their families and pay war risk insurance and buy liberty bonds. Why shouldn't they? They aren't running the risk of being killed or having their bodies mangled or their minds shattered. They aren't sleeping in muddy trenches. They aren't hungry. The soldiers are. Give capital and industry and labor 30 days to think it over and you will find by that time there will be no war. That will smash the racket, that and nothing else. Maybe I'm a little too optimistic. Capital still has some say, so capital won't permit the taking of profit out of war until the people, those who do the suffering and still pay the price, make up their minds that those they elect to office shall do their bidding and not that of the profiteers. You know, so here you get to like a a, a kind of a, um, an argument, you know, that's like, Hyperbole, right? Yeah. Hey, what you need to do is first just to, if you're gonna go and and if you know no one will argue with it because it, it makes sense, but it's just it's it's just an unrealistic thing to think about. Um, unfortunately, guy, okay, we all get the idea. Yep, you want to go? You want to go to war? Cool. And he's the, the interesting. He's not even talking about them going to war. He's just talking about you just get the pay for. And he's only talking about for thirty days. <laughs> He's only talking about for 30 days. 30 days, you know, you're the CEO of a, of a defense company. For 30 days, you're going to get this pay. I actually don't think that's enough right now. <laughs> I think it'd have to be a, a lot more. You, you know, you always hear that. And actually, the, when, when, you, when you read about the Vietnam War, one of the things that really started to turn the tide of the American public against the Vietnam War was the draft because all of a sudden it wasn't just you know the the freaking poor redneck from West Virginia or the inner city black kid from Harlem that was getting shipped off to war all of a sudden it was like oh you're in a you're from wherever and your your dad is a lawyer your dad is a judge your dad is a business owner and you got a bunch of money and guess what yep yeah load up load up on the bus because it's time to go get some. And that st- as that expanded, and normal, richer people started going to war, it was like rich kids, the rich parents started sending their kids off to war, that's a problem. And that's one of the things that started to push the, 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 the resistance against the Vietnam War. Because when it was just, hey, we're sending a bunch of damn poor people, Hey, cool, whatever. That's not my kid. My kid's not. My kid's going to freaking uh, uh, college next year. He's not going to boot camp. He's not going to nom. So I don't care. Yeah, it seems like a great idea. Let's stop communism over there until little Johnny gets freaking <laughs> called up, and then they're like, "Ooh, maybe not." So I would say, from that perspective, that's that that's a, a good assessment, realistic assessment. That if you start saying, "Oh yeah, you want to send you want to send America to war?" Cool, your kid goes. People start changing their freaking minds real quick. Factually. <clears throat> he doesn't stop there, he's got another step. Another step, which is funny because he, he starts off by saying this is the only thing you need to do, but he does have another step. Another step necessary in this fight to smash the war racket is limited, a limited place, plebiscite, sorry, plebiscite, which is a plebiscite is, is a direct vote. Like it's just a vote, plebiscite. Another step necessary in this war, in this fight to smash the war racket is the limited plebiscite to determine whether a war should be declared. A plebiscite, not of all the voters, but merely of those who would be called upon to do the fighting and dying. 
There wouldn't be very much sense in having a 76-year-old president of a munitions factory or the flat-footed head of an international baking firm or the cross-eyed manager of a uniform manu- manufacturing plant, all of whom see, see visions of tremendous profits in the event of war, voting on whether the nation should go to war or not. They never would be called upon to shoulder arms, to sleep in the trench, and to be shot. Only those who would be called upon to risk their lives for country should have the privilege of voting to determine whether the nation should go to war. There is ample precedent for restricting the voting to those affected. Many of our states have restrictions on those permitted to vote. In most, it is necessary to be able to read and write before you may vote. In some, you must own property. It would be a simple matter each year for the men coming of military age to register in their communities as they did in the draft during the World War and be physically examined. Those who could pass and who were therefore to be who would therefore be called upon to bear arms in the event of a war would be eligible to vote in a limited plebiscite. They should be the ones to have the power to decide and not a Congress, few of those few of whose members are within the age limit and fewer still of whom are in the physical condition to bear arms. Only those who must suffer should have the right to vote. There you go. And as I said, in, in Nam, that kind of worked. People said, not Johnny. And he said there was one step, and he's introduced two. Here's the third one. <laughs> A third step in this business of smashing war racket is to make certain that our military forces are truly for forces for defense only. At each session of Congress, the question whether, a f- whether further naval ap- appropriations comes up. The swivel chair admirals of Washington, and there are always a lot of them, are very adroit lobbyists, and they are smart. They don't shout that we need a lot of b- battleships, we need a lot of battleships to war on this nation or that nation. Nation. Oh no! First of all, they let it be known that America is menaced by a great naval power. Almost any day, these admirals will tell you the great fleet of this supposed enemy will strike suddenly and annihilate 125 million people just like that. Then they begin to cry for a larger navy for what? To fight the enemy. Oh my, no, oh no, for defense purposes only. Then incidentally, they announce maneuvers in the Pacific for defense, Uh uh-huh. The Pacific is a great big ocean. We have tremendous coastline on the Pacific. Will the maneuvers be off the coast two or 300 miles? Oh no, the maneuvers will be 2,000, yes, perhaps even 3,500 miles off the coast. The Japanese, a proud people, of course, will be pleased beyond expression to see the United States fleet so close to Nippon's shores, even as pleased as would be the residents of California were they to dimly discern through the morning mist the Japanese fleet playing at war games off Los Angeles. The ships of our Navy, it can be seen, should specifically limited by law, should be specifically limited by law to within 200 miles of our coastline. Had that been the law of 1898, the Maine never would have gone to Havana Harbor. She never would have been blown up. There never would have been no war with Spain with the attendant loss of life. 200 miles is ample in the opinion of experts for defense purposes. Our nation cannot start an offensive war if it is ships can't go further than 200 miles off the coastline. Planes might be permitted to go 500 miles from the coast for the purpose of reconnaissance and the army should never leave the territorial limits of our nation. To summarize, Three steps must be taken to smash the war racket. One, we must take the profit out of war. Two, we must permit the youth of the land who would bear arms to decide whether or not there should be war. And three, we must limit our military forces to home defense purposes. Again, um, not great strategic plan to sit back and like just stay in your own AO. You want to project power a little bit. You don't have to piss people off, but you definitely want to project some power out there. What are you writing down, Dave? I'm just summarizing what he said. I'm just trying to, I'm spending all this time just trying to appreciate what he's saying. Because obviously, and I'm going to wait, you know, I know there's a couple more things to read here. I'm going to, I'm going to wait to the the conclusion, but I spent a lot of time in my own brain saying, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Well, this is a, but there's a, yeah. Well, this is the thing that we have to do. That's like what the whole start of this thing. Yeah. Hey. Hey, listen, man, we just spent a trillion dollars totally, man. in a 20-year war. And when we got there, the Taliban was in control of whatever percentage of the, of the country. And now we left, and they're now they're in control of 100% of the country. Totally. We spent a trillion dollars. We have thousands of 
lost lives. We have thousands more wounded, maimed for life. Yeah. And 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 th- you have to at least open your mind and say, okay, what what's this guy talking about? Yeah. What was he talking about? Because like you said, this isn't some armchair quarterback. This is a guy that fought. Chapter five, to hell with war. Um, I am not as fooled to believe that war is a thing of the past. I know the people do not want war, but there is no use in saying we cannot be pushed into another war. Looking back, Woodrow Wilson was reelected president in 1916 on a platform that he had, quote, kept us out of war, end quote, and on the implied promise that he would, quote, keep us out of war. Yet five months later, he asked Congress to declare war on Germany. In that five-month interval, the people had not been asked whether they had changed their minds. The four million young men who put on uniforms and marched or sailed away were not asked whether they wanted to go forth and s- to suffer and die. Then what caused our government to change its mind so suddenly? Money. An allied commission, it may be recalled, came over shortly before the war declaration and called on the president. The president summoned a group of advisors. The head of the commission spoke. Stripped of its diplomatic language, this is what he told the president and his group. There's no use in kidding ourselves any longer. The cause of the allies is lost. We now owe you. American bankers, American munition makers, makers, American manufacturers, American speculators, American exporters, five or six billion dollars. If we lose, and without the help of the United States we will use, we, England, France, Italy, cannot pay back this money, and Germany won't. So, end quote. Had secrecy been outlawed as far as war negotiations were concerned, and had the press been invited to be present at that conference, or had the radio been available to broadcast the proceedings, America never would have entered the world war. But this conference, like all war discussions, was shrouded in utmost secrecy. When our boys were sent off to war, they were told it was a, quote, war to make the world safe for democracy, and a, quote, war to end all wars. Well, 18 years after, the world has less of democracy than it had. Besides, what business is it of ours whether Russia or Germany or England or France or Italy or Austria live under democracies or monarchies? Whether they are fascists or communists, our problem is to to preserve our own democracy. And very little, if anything, has been accomplished to assure us that the world war was really the war to end all wars. Yes, we have disarmament conferences and limitations of arms conferences. They don't mean a thing. One has just failed. The results of another have been nullified. We send our professional soldiers and sailors and our politicians and our diplomats to these conferences. And what happens? The professional soldiers and sailors don't want to disarm. No admiral wants to be without a ship. No general wants to be without a command. Both mean men, both mean men without jobs. They are not for disarmament. They cannot be for limitations of arms. And at all these conferences, lurking in the background, but all powerful just the same, are the sinister agents who profit by war. They see it to it that these conferences do not disarm or seriously limit armaments. The chief aim of any power at any of these conferences has not been to achieve disarmament to prevent war, but rather to get more armament for itself and less for any potential flow. Foe. I, I remember having this thought when you and I were in the Battle of Ramadi, and that thought was how freaking awesome the US military was and how much of that awesomeness relied on these individual human beings that were making things happen. Because when you look at the operations that were taking place, when you look at the effort that was put forth, it was literally platoon commanders, company commanders, battalion commanders, brigade commander, that was that was through force of will 
making things happen. Making things happen. You could, if, if, if the brigade commander didn't really care and just wanted to kind of do a deployment and get it under his belt and just like, uh, yep, I did my deployment. If he didn't care, if he didn't want to do good, we wouldn't have done anything. Yeah. Right. A, a battalion commander that's going to push into an area of operations that hasn't been pushed into, there is individual effort. And here's what's scary is look in the battle of Ramadi we were trying to we were trying to stabilize and secure the city of Ramadi if there's no goal like that a clearly defined goal and you have people that are trying to do make their best individual effort to make their mark to leave their mark to do something to get a good fit rep what are you going to do you're going to say well I could, I, we, I, we're going to do this we're going to do that we're going to expand we're going to grow more i need more people this idea that there's no real competing, competing um, asset or competing, competing uh, perspective of someone that's saying, "Hey, wait a second, what, what are you actually doing over there?" I mean, if let's say you went, you were, you were in the Marine Corps, and you were supposed to train Iraqi soldiers, and I do turnover with you, and you say, "Yep, hey, Jocko, we trained 100 Iraqi soldiers." And I go, that's great. How many Iraqi soldiers do you think I'm going to train? How many think? 101. <laughs> At least 101. Yeah. At least 101. Yeah. I'm going to do more than you. Totally. I'm going to do more than you. I remember, this is back in the day, I remember going out on a, um, workups with the, with the fleet. And you could see, I did a workup with the fleet that was, I wasn't, I wasn't embarked, but we did some work with uh, Marines. Then my next deployment, I did a full workup with the Marines. Then the next one, I did another full workup with the Marines. So I did basically saw three workups in a row with the Marines. And each one of them was a little bit more. Each workup was a little bit more. For sure. Hey, oh yeah, you guys did you guys did four amphibious landings? Oh yeah. I'm gonna do five. We did five. Yeah. Oh, what about the next one? The next guy's doing six. This is real. Yeah. I had similar experience. And even in training, uh, you know. Classic question is the, the outgoing squadron versus the incoming squadron. How many pounds of wardens did you drop? You know, 74,000. Cool. Hey, right on the board. We're <laughs> dropping 75K. And that's why I said 101. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which for sure. like, 101. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I did, I did one, a little more. bit more than you. Yep, whatever that is. Um, yeah, uh, 100%. 100%. So when you get, so that, that just reminds me of what we're talking about here, which is no admiral goes, you know what? I think we need less ships. The amount of admirals that say that is zero. Totally. The amount of generals that say, I need less divisions, I need less brigades, I need less battalions, the number of generals that say that is zero. Or, you know, well, sure, are there some? I'm sure there are. But the vast majority, and those, those few that say, well, I think we need less ships, he, he's, not getting, he's definitely not getting promoted. He's not going to be the CNO. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's definitely not going to be the CNO. <laughs> hey, I'm the guy that downsized the Navy. Promote me. It's not happening. Right. <laughs> It's not happening. Hey, I got us less brigades, less combat brigades. Good job. Yeah, well, let's promote you. No one says that. So you have this self-fulfilling prophecy and this self-licking ice cream cone, which yeah. is a term I understand what it means, but I'm not exactly sure you know, where it came from. Right. But that's what you have, right, is we want to have more. And that's exactly what he's talking about here. There was no one, there was very few people that would come back and say, hey, uh, yeah, the Iraqi soldiers, we had to do it in Ramadi. We had to say, these guys are not ready yet. Because it was, it was so obvious what would happen if we just sent them out on their own. And they tried. I mean, you remember they turned over like some of the checkpoints, like two, nine, or five, and uh, they turned it over, and, and two days later, the insurgents hit it and overrun it. Yep. Uh, ECP-3 down there by, on the bridge, same thing. Turned it over to the Iraqis. Hey, these guys are ready. You know, it's like, actually, no, they weren't ready, and they got annihilated. So there wasn't really the, the opportunity for us to be like, well, are, yeah, the Iraqi troops that we are trained are now 100%, what would they call it? What would they call it? For, they're ready for unilateral operations. Right. I didn't send up a message saying, yep, our Iraqis that we've been training for six months are now ready for unilateral operations, even though that was what everybody wanted us to say, but we couldn't say it there because you would find out on their first operation that there is no possible way they were ready. But if we would have been a more permissive environment, the pressure to say, yeah, hey, they can conduct unilateral, unilateral operations, the pressure would have been so great because otherwise it'd be like, hey, Jocko, 
the last the last uh, task unit commander that's out here has you know he trained up four platoon special mission unit elements that are now re- that were now ready to perform unilateral operations what did you do i'd be like well actually i don't think those four are even capable and we should downgrade them well what's wrong with you jocko the last task unit commander was able to do this why couldn't you do that so you, you would have felt that pressure and a lot of times people break to that pressure I, I mean obviously i think that happened a lot in afghanistan yeah hey, we train these guys for six months now who says yeah we trained somebody for six months they're not capable we train them for a year they're not capable it's difficult it's a difficult thing to do it's also difficult to assess so i think you get this that's what he's talking about here there's no no admiral wants to be without a ship no general wants to be without a command so what do they do they want more there's only one way back to the book there's only one way to disarm any semblance of practicability that is for all nations to get together and scrap every ship, every gun, every rifle, every tank, every warplane. Even this, if it were possible, would not be enough. The next war, according to experts, will not be fought with battleships, not by artillery, not with rifles, and not with machine guns, but it will be fought with deadly chemicals and gases. Secretly, each nation is studying and perfecting newer and ghastlier means of annihilating its, fo- its foes wholesale. Yes, ships will continue to be built, for the shipbuilders must make their profits, and guns will still be manufactured, manufactured, and powder and rifles will be made, for the munitions makers must make their huge profits. And the soldiers, of course, must wear uniforms, for the manufacturer must make their war profits too. But victory or defeat will be determined by the skill and ingenuity of our scientists. If we put them to work, making poison gas and more and more fiendish mechanical and explosive instruments of destruction, they will have no time for the constructive job of building greater prosperity for all peoples. By putting them to this useful job, we can all make more money out of peace than we can out of war, even the munitions makers. So I say, to hell with war. And that's the end of it. Um, again, you know, he's he's in the end, you know, kind of uh, got the fantasy, got the fantasy argument of, hey, can't we just have people working on good, have the scientists working on good stuff instead of evil stuff? And like, yeah, cool. Like, so it's it's such an extreme argument that people go, oh, he's he's just crazy, right? Mm-hmm. And let's throw this whole book out. Um, but. If we're to actually listen to what he's saying and maybe put some of it in the crazy pot and put some of it in the just factual pot and then some of it is debatable like okay well, what does that actually mean how does that apply today I think it's I think it's very important for us to do that I, I was recently on Russell Brand's podcast and it, the thing is it's behind a paywall is that right yes sir Pay, a firewall paywall no, paywall it's behind a paywall and so Russell Brand, if you don't know who he is, he's a, a guy from England, super nice guy, very funny guy. He's, is he originally a comedian? Kind of a movie comedian? Yeah, kind of, and, and a performer as well. So he does? A.K.A. Aldous Snow. What's his now? Aldous Snow, that's his other alias. Oh, really? Yeah, that's like his character, you know. And what's that guy supposed to be like? A singer. Really? Yeah, get him to the Greek... Uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, look into it. That's okay. who Russell Brand is. Yeah. Okay, he's a man. So it was he an act? He's an actor too. Yes, sir. Everything. Look, super nice guy. Yep. Um, and he, he asked me to be on his podcast, and it was pretty. It's pretty cool because he started off the podcast. He was saying like he was being real complimentary of me, and like and 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 just being nice. You know, he, this guy. You know, he he thanked me for my service, and and. He, you know, he, he he said I did great bunch of great stuff and and real, real complimentary and real nice and and I kind of said hey man I, I appreciate it I said bro I'm not like this I'm not a rare uh, hero from the military I said I had a kind of average career um, and then he goes well you know I just wanted to say that because I want you to know that I respect the military but because I want to set that up properly because I also have like some issues and I'm gonna probably go. 
he didn't use the term hard in the paint because he's from England, sure. but he basically meant I'm going to go hard in the paint on some topics. And then I said, well, hey, you should then know that even though I spent my adult life in the military, I was also like a, a hardcore kid growing up, listening to heavy metal, playing in bands. I'm a rebellious kid. I listen to punk rock and heavy metal. And so you should just know that too, that even though I, cause he, he also mentioned that he was like, as I look like a hippie. And I was like, cause I know I look like a, the most military human that you could imagine. That's true. Yeah. That I also know that, you know, you should know that I'm kind of a rebel and, and that as well. And so then we had a little laugh and, um, so, so eventually, you know, we get to, the, we start having the conversation and then he posed this kind of two questions and they were somehow paired up or they were somehow, there was like a semicolon between them, meaning they were attached. They weren't quite separate, but they were still attached, but they were, they were a little bit separate. So the, one of them was like, isn't war driven by the profitability of the military industrial complex? That was kind of question number one. And then similar question, isn't capitalism and, and businesses and corporations, aren't they simply driven by the profitability for the rich owners and shareholders. So, so that was kind of the question. Aren't these two major forces in the world, the military and the corporate world, aren't they just driven by greed, essentially? And then I answered him. And I, you know, my answer was, well, Russell, <laughs> the answer is yes. And I think, I think he was a little bit taken aback by that answer, but the fact of the matter is, it's true that profits certainly drive corporations to do things, to, to make products. And defense companies certainly get rich during wars, as we just heard from Smedley Butler. Those are totally true, totally true. And just like Smedley Butler, like you and I were saying, Dave, that that's like one part of the argument. That's not the only driver. That's not the only driver. And I mean, for the corporate example, I've worked with hundreds of companies. And Dave, you've worked with hundreds of companies and the companies make money. They make a lot of money. And they are certainly driven by profits in some way, but they're also making products that people want and they're making products that people need and they're employing people. And they're making products that make people's lives better. That's what's happening in, in, in the vast majority of cases. No better example than medical device companies, pharmaceutical companies. And I've worked with scores of medical device companies. I've worked with scores of pharmaceutical companies over the last decade. and. Some of those companies that I've worked with, that you've worked with, Dave, some of those companies make hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in profit. Billions of dollars in profit. And so you could say to yourself, well, that's what's driving them, just don't wanna make money. But I have also seen and met their patients along the way. You go to an event and they got a, a man or a woman or a, ch a child, a little boy or a little girl. And the only reason that that child is still alive is because of this device that that company makes or this drug that this company makes. That's, that's, that's why they are on stage. They, they will present and they'll get these people up there and say thank you. And those patients who are only alive because of these companies are grateful to be alive and they are overjoyed that those capitalist doctors were greedy enough, right, to take the risk and invest money and push hard and toil and do the work to create products that actually saved people's lives. And the same thing, the same thing can be said for war. The same thing can be said for war. And I have participated in wars that made some defense companies tons of money. And I said, I said to Russell Brand something along the lines of like, listen, I could be talking to my platoon and say, all right, guys, 
Here's what's going on tonight. We're gonna go out, we're gonna risk our lives in it. And I just wanted to let you know that every round that you fire is gonna put 12 cents into the pockets of the wartime profiteers, right? And, and that would actually be true, because that is true. Those, those rounds cost money, and those defense companies make money from those things. But I also know what happens on the ground. Dave, you know what happens on the ground. I know, I know that we help people. The people on the ground. I know that we killed evil terrorists and insurgents that systematically tortured and raped and murdered the innocent local populace. I I know that we did that. I know that we were able to protect children from these insurgents, from these terrorists. I know we were able to protect families. I know that those families wanted these insurgents out of their city and out of their country. And so while there were defense companies certainly making money, there was a simultaneous good that was taking place. And we took lives, but we also saved lives. And that's the truth. Enriching global corporations and enriching the military industrial complex, that enrichment certainly influences behaviors, right? It, inf- it influences someone that's making a weapon system to try and make their weapon system better, to try and make better body armor. There's, a, there's someone right now, as we speak, that is trying to make better body armor, and part of the reason they're trying to make it is to protect the American soldier, but guess what? They got a mortgage to pay. And they want to make better better body armor because they want to make more money. And if they can make better body armor, then the U.S. government goes, wow, that's lighter, it's stronger, it p- provides more protection, we're going to buy it. It's not that the person is just thinking about money, but the money, the, the, the two goals are aligned. There's a simultaneous drive that is, that is moving behavior in the right direction. And oftentimes, like I just used that example of body armor, they're aligned. Well, there's a company out there, Acme Body Armor. They want to make best body armor. They want to make it, do they want to protect Americans? Yes, they do. Do they want to make money? Yes, they do. So I have no problem with that. If they're aligned, it works out perfectly. Here's the problem. The problem is if they're out of alignment. That's where it can become awful, and that's what we need to watch out for. What is the driving force behind going to war? Are we going to war because it's the right thing to do? Are we going to war for benevolent reasons? Are, are we positive that it will have a, a positive impact that will offset the natural negative impacts of war? Because when you go into war, there's going to be negative impacts. People are going to die. People are going to get wounded. And is the positive impact going to offset that negative impact? Is it going to help stability? In the world, is there a strategic benefit for us as America? If we're going to war for those reasons, because there's gonna be a strategic advantage, because it protects our national security, because it's gonna be truly good for the people on the ground that need protection, that need help to get out from a tyrannical, a tyrannical regime or an evil regime, and there are evil regimes, And if you don't think there's evil regimes, you're wrong. Because there's people in the world, there's regimes in the world that will systematically rape little kids. So if we're going to war for those reasons, okay, we can consider it. If the primary driver of going to war is to make money, if it's to profit, if it's to sell more guns and bombs, if it's not going to stabilize the world, if it doesn't help us protect our national security, if it's going to be a strategic defeat, then we're wrong. And, and can there be alignment by these two drivers? Yes, there absolutely can. I don't mind. I don't mind someone making great body armor, ma- making money off it. I don't make. I don't mind somebody making a great weapon system that makes a bunch of money and it helps us win a war, I have no problem with that at all. But if these things aren't aligned and we're fighting for money or we're fighting for profit and we're not getting positive impact and we're not getting strategic benefit, 
well then we need to listen to major general smedley butler and say to hell with war that's what i'm thinking dave um <clears throat> i'm with you i was thinking of a story as you as you said that i i don't even remember why i was in the pentagon but i was in the pentagon for something and it was maybe like i was just taking over this f-35 job and i had to go meet somebody in the pentagon whatever dave came up to the pentagon to talk to some general i'm I'm literally walking through the halls of the pentagon and i run into who was an old battalion commander that i work with who is now happened to be a one star just literally walked into him in a in a waiting room of some office somewhere waiting for some meeting and we bumped into each other and he was there with a couple people from a company in industry so civilians in the industry and he was there to show the technology of a helmet that they designed to stop a 762 caliber sniper rifle. A helmet light enough but strong enough to stop a sniper rifle. And for those of you who are listening that don't know the story of, and I've talked in general terms about my radio operator, Chris Leon, who was on my team, the first Anglico Marine killed, my radio operator was killed in Ramadi. The first Anglico Marine killed in Iraq was my radio operator, was shot and killed by a sniper that pierced his helmet, went right through the temple of his helmet and killed him. Was I on board with this company making profit, making money off the American taxpayer to design a helmet that would somehow have prevented what happened or at least can prevent what might happen in the future? Yes, I'm on board with that plan. I'm on board with that plan and I support that plan and I want that plan to not only make them money, but make enough money to continue to build even better technology, grow their company and be a positive force for whatever may happen. So I am... I am totally on board with that idea and this idea of alignment. And while, while where I struggled, especially towards the end, listening to him talk, you reading his words was, I think a trap that is so easy to fall into is that we describe it as the government or industry or the military. One of the things that I've learned in, in our current job is that these are actually people. They're people. The, the military is just people and generals and admirals are regular people and you know what there are some really good ones and there are some not so good ones and people in the government I, I know classmates of mine that are that work in the government and you know what they try to do most of the time every day the right thing they try to do the right thing do they always do the right thing no are there forces at play that make it difficult of course but when you fall into this trap of like oh it's the government it's really easy to create a narrative by which their only goal is to somehow, whether it's lie in their pockets or whatever that might be, is we lose sight of the fact that most of the mechanics that are going on inside industry, these companies we work with, are regular people trying to do the right thing. Even for the most part of my experience, at the highest levels, we work with CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies. And what you get to know is that for the most part, for the most part, there are people trying to do the right thing. Are they trying to make money? Yes. Mm-hmm. Because for a whole host of good reasons, they want to pay their bills. They want to pay their people. They want to grow. They want to expand. They want to build brighter products that are safer. They can reach more people. All these things. And I'm not naive. And I don't want people to think the exact opposite. Where it's like everybody's just altruistic in it for the, for the big one. No, that, that's not the case. But there's a trap that we can fall into, which was there's this this thing, the industry. Well, if it's just the industry, then yeah, it's easy to paint them as, as this, this thing that's not a real thing. It's not a person. It's not a human being. And what this thing wants is to just soak up dollar bills or waste human life to get to their end state with no regard for that. And, and that, is a, a, that is a trap that... I think it's easy to fall into and you can hear his words like, hey, hang on a second. Just hang on. Who is this company? Who are these industries or governments or whatever these things we're talking about? Most of the time, most of the time, there are people trying to do the right thing. That's what they are most of the time. Yeah. Uh, You know what survivor bias is? Yes. Yeah. Do you know what it is, Dave? I think so. It's like um, if you go out and you talk to 10 people that started companies and you say, you know, hey, 
how hard was it to start your company? They're all like, yeah, it was pretty easy, man. You know, I got it going. You're not talking to the 90 other people that failed. Yeah. So you get this survivor bias. We at Echelon Front probably have a little bit of Echelon Front bias, which is we mo- the companies that we work with, they've read Extreme Ownership, they're in the game, they listen to podcasts. Like these, these are companies that have a, a good sort of fundamental value system. So we, we kind of have a little bit of that bias because you're right, yeah. the amount of companies that we've worked with where I've said, wow, this guy is gonna put this product out there that's harmful, or this guy or this woman is making a decision that's gonna cause their employees to suffer. It doesn't happen. It do- now, are there companies like that? Yes, there are. And, and, but I would tell you, same thing, even though even with even if you take into account the EF bias, the echelon front bias, which is that most people that we work with have a good value system, even with that accounted for, most companies these days, you have to have a good value system. You have to be doing the right thing because there's just too much information out there. And a damn Yelp review. I mean, on the like this the the base level, mm. hey, if you run a restaurant and you treat your employees or your customers bad a Yelp review now you go big and you run into you know the Wall Street Journal is doing an expose on what you did to maximize profits while you hurt your you know your your employees or your clients or whatever so so the even in cases where you have people that might not be the most altruistic people yeah the reality of modern technology keeps keeps the vast majority of them in check. Yes, so that's true. The other thing is, look, there's going to be these two these two things. They create a nice, positive, natural tension. That's what we want. We want to have someone saying like, "Hey, yeah, if you guys go to war, we want you to have the best gear. That's good." And the other the 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 business should be saying, "Hey, if we want you to go to war, we want you to have the best gear." And the general should be saying, yeah, we don't want to go to war, but if we do, we want the best gear. Totally. There's a little tension. These guys might want to go to war more. These guys might not, but there, there should be a natural tension. And I think what we have to watch out for is when there's no, when people lose, the, when there's no tension. Yeah. When there's no one saying, hey, hey, you know, you, know, you know, I just want you to think about something. If we go to war, it's Johnny over here that's going to get killed that's gonna lose his legs, whatever the case may be. That's what we never, that's what we need to make sure people think about. And you know, this goes back to one of the, fir- actually I think it might have been the first like ever thing that I got recorded saying was when we did the the Warfighters thing for the History Channel about Mark Lee. And I've repeated this on a bunch of occasions. What, you, how do you know when it's time to go to war? And the, the, the it's time when you are willing, when you, when you are willing you have the will, but it's the will to die and it's the will to kill. And that's what's going to happen when you go to war. So you need to put that overlay on this. Yeah. And if you ever forget about that overlay, that you think, well, you know, this is worth it because it's going to be beneficial. Okay, well, cool. It's going to be beneficial to the people there. Do you know that we're going to kill some of the people there? Not just the enemy, but some of the people that are there are going to die because of us. And we're going to have our own people killed. That's what we need to think about. We can never lose that tension. And, and I think that that tension does get lost. I think that the people that, that hold up their hands say, hold on, wait a second. But what are we doing here? And, and part of the reason is because, what is it? There's a saying, old men want to go to war and young men do too. I mean, you know, it's, that's the thing. You survey freaking 19 year old kids that are in the Marine Corps. And you ask them how many people, how many you want to go to war? <laughs> There's a big percentage yes. that's coming through in the affirmative. And that's the coolest part about the comment about that tension, which is, I mean, that's actually the tension that you want is I want, I actually want Marines that want to go to war. 100%. That's what I want. I want Marines that want to go to war. And do I love the idea of world peace? Yes. I love that idea. I love that idea. That idea is not going to happen today or tomorrow. It's not going to happen. And as, as much as I love the fantasy of this, the, the simple things we need to do to, to achieve that, the, the, the tension is, you know, with that reality too, is that, hey, not only is that not likely, there are people that actively do not want that, actively do not want that. And, you know, 
he, he, I was, he was talking about, hey, you know, the next step is we're going to see war uh, with chemicals. And, and he was sort of foreshadowing what the, ne- and he was correct. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we, you know, we, we know that there was, you know, some of those things he saw that in World War II, the chemical warfare, and he was foreshadowing this ever growing capacity for people to wage war against each other in these awful, awful ways. Well, you know, you could get rid of all the weapons in the world and there's people waging war with computers now. Mm-hmm. So this, this, this persistence of the reality even with some of the nefarious things and the profiteers that might be out there, there's a reality out there that we also need to, to accept and face. And I want to be around people that, that want to do that. I, I want to be around those people. And I want Marines, I want Marines that have that exact same feeling. And yes, do you want to manage that and temper that and guide that and shape it? Yes, all those things. But I want to be around those people. And yeah. I think that that tension that you, you talked about, that natural tension, because those two things exist in the world. And to pretend like they don't is is not a good plan. Yeah, I don't know what the percentage of people. Uh, let's say you, let's say you did what they said. If you take the young men that are going to have to go to war, and they get to vote, I almost feel I almost don't feel super comfortable with that because I think a lot of them would be like, "Oh yeah, um, it's yeah, on. Here's my chance. Yeah, <laughs> it's on." But but I'm not sure. That's also my own warped. That's sort of the Jocko bias, which is I think everyone's kind of thinks like me, which I know is not true. There's also a chance that I'm wrong, and a bunch of people would say, no matter what was happening in the world, they'd be like, "No, we're not going to war." Right. You know what I mean? So you got to have somebody with a detached perspective. Yeah. That's actually saying, you know what? Now is not the time to go to war, or a detached perspective and say, hey, we're looking at this whole thing. We see Nazis. We see them running roughshod all over. We need to do something yeah. about this. And you described it again. I, 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 the, you know, whether you call it the tension or, or, or this idea, hey, when you've got some skin in the game, when it's not Johnny, it's your Johnny, mm-hmm. when you're talking about who's going to war. I, I, yeah, I love that idea of, oh, you're talking about me now? Okay, hang on. Let me let me put some thought into it because in the end, the answer actually might still be, yeah, I'm going to send my son off to war. But I'm certainly going to think about it a lot harder the closer it is to me. And I mean, that's been the challenge in society forever, which was, do we want to insulate our people from war? Yeah, we do. I want I want to insulate America from war. And you could look at, we talked about Afghanistan. Are, are there some good things that have come out of that? Yeah, absolutely. And if you insulate them so much, if you if you remove them so much that they don't even understand what really is happening, those decisions actually aren't the best decisions because what do they care, right? Yeah, sure, it's a great idea. Go, go, go to war. Um, doesn't affect me at all. I, I don't want a society that has no no impact on that either. And even inside that, you talk about the tension of I want to keep, I want to s- separate us from that as much as possible. But if not. But not so much that they don't understand what it actually what, what that really means to send somebody off to war. We were just talking an hour ago when these people went to World War One. Did they even know what they were doing? They even know what it meant to send someone to war. And, and there's just no way. Yeah, there's some some great things with technology, and and if you're doing something for the wrong reason, it's pretty it's it's much harder to hide that now than it ever used to be. If your industrial plan or your company plan is really nefarious, <laughs> yeah. you're. You're running the risk of getting found out. There's just too much information that's free out there. It's really hard to keep those secrets anymore. But sending somebody off to World War One, do you think anybody really knew what that meant? No. No. And do I do you think they should know a little bit? Yeah, I see his point. You, it's your kid going. You might think twice before you you send him. But just like you said too, there are actually times that you're gonna say yeah, because the alternative. Yep. That's not acceptable. <sighs> well. Definitely, um, I think the lesson here is keep your minds open and listen and try and understand these various perspectives that are out there because I bet there's a bunch of people that hear this and they go, well, that guy was a traitor or whatever they're going to say. Yeah. Or say, hell yeah. It's, it's, it's just, that's what makes it so interesting because you can't call a guy that did what he did in his life a traitor. And what we should actually do is listen. <laughs> That's what we should do. With an open mind. With an open mind. Goes a long way. Yeah. With that, Echo Charles. Yes, sir. So we're trying to keep our minds open, right. but we're also trying to keep our minds sharp. Yes, sir. Keep the sharp minds. Got to keep the, the vessel that the mind is contained in. Got to keep that kind of up and running. Sure. Concur? The brain? Well, yeah. No, or well, the brain, the brain is in the body. Sure. The skull, more specifically, I guess. More specifically, yep. See, look at you. I'm trying. 
Well, very yeah, there, accretive to my comments. There was there was a uh, there was a <laughs> part in there where he was he was kind of going hard, you know, exposing all these prophets and all this yep. stuff, and it makes sense, man. So and you can kind of get a taste of his th- emotional it, 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 state, it, it, right? It makes sense, but also you got to say, hey, man, if I was having to fight the freaking Nazis, how happy am I that I have some American steel yeah. manufacturer that is staying awake twenty four hours a day? You ever seen that that when they used to build those Liberty ships? You know what I'm talking about, Dave? Yes. There's these big Liberty ships that were used to transport stuff back and across, back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. They were making them in a day. Yeah. A freaking whole ship, bro. This is impossible. And America yeah. was doing it in a day. Now, if I was over there on the front lines and I needed some more ammunition, I would be so damn happy and I would be more than happy that people are making a bunch of money. Now, did the, did the profits get a little bit extreme? Maybe they got a little extreme. Yeah, so in, in that that's kind of the point there where you can kind of, he goes hard in like both directions and you're like, oh man, I see that. I, especially when he's talking about the waste, you know, mm-hmm. like the ships that don't oh, even yeah. run and it's like, no, we're still paying the bill. And it's like, and then meanwhile, you know, from his perspective, he sees all the, all the downside of yeah. war, right? Hardcore. And then he kind of sees, and he looks and he sees all these numbers, all these dollar signs that go to other people or whatever, who are making shitty ships mm-hmm. and all this stuff. Oh man, I get it. But he went a little bit too hard in a bun in a even in these little too, subtle ways. Too extreme. Extreme. Right? So he goes and it makes you shut him out. About the little bit, yep. yes. And and I was trying to stay like with you guys were like, okay, I get it. No, 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 maybe not. Maybe. But there was a part he was talking about the boots, right? Mm-hmm. He was like, Oh, they made all these boots and like all this stuff or whatever. And I'm so I'm thinking, wait, that's the we kinda need those boots. But we only had four million soldiers and we bought twenty five million boots. Yes. Okay. And then that part it's like, okay, yes. As far as the waste right, goes, hundred percent. Right, 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 that's gonna right, apply right. across the board. Um and then he he went on to even add, like, oh, those were good boots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah we need those boots. Yeah, but the we don't waste, need twenty five. Of course, million. of course. We don't need the waste. That's true. Same thing with the ships and all that stuff. But so you could tell like all you got to do is kind of detach from like that very specific right. perspective just a little bit and you're like, okay, this guy might not be getting it you know, in certain ways. Well, I, I don't think that's a great example because you can also say, hey, he gets it. These are boots. We need boots. They're good boots. They're probably lasting for a long time. We didn't need 25 million pairs, yeah. bro. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So he, he's getting it. Where he loses it is just saying that that's the only reason that they're doing anything. Right. And that's what I mean. Where and Because that's it seemed like it, put it this way. It seemed like he was going hard in that yeah. direction. It's like his, that's what he kind of wanted yeah. you to think. Yeah, it's it also shows you that the you know you have a government organization that's running things, mm-hmm. and it's not your money. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna get fraud, waste, and abuse. Yeah, that makes in a sense. big way. That's why that's why it's usually better to have a little bit less government control over things. Yeah, that's so to true. Keep things as decentralized as possible. Yeah. And I know I covered a, a little bit of uh, of uh, Thomas Sowell's book. I think I don't even know if I even got to it. It was I don't I don't think you were on the podcast. It was with Jordan Peterson, but he got this little section where he just talks about how freaking hard it is to like control price. You just it, you, you can't you can't do it. You mm. can't control price. Mm. It has to do with the pelts of some animal. And they, there's a worth a certain amount, mm. and, and then he goes through how hard it is to control the price, and then he says, and by the way, there's whatever 1.2 billion products or line items that you need to control the price of. It's impossible. Mm. You gotta let the free market work a little bit. Yeah. And that's where you run into problems where you have the free market brush up against the government, the government uh, checkbook. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, we can make, a, you're probably gonna need 25 million. Yeah. Boots, how many soldiers you got? Four million. They need extra. Yeah. Sign here. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah, it's true, huh? Because you know, like, the, when you get what the old thing, the, the irresponsible person with a cr- when they first get a credit card, kind of feels like, oh, it's not my money, right? Mm. So then they overspend, they can't pay that kind of stuff. So it's like, an, like it makes sense that phenomenon. It does make sense. People will spend their other people's money like crazy. Yeah. They do it all the time. That's what the government does. Yeah. The government spends other people's money all the time. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> do we need to spend some money? Yeah. Yeah, but if you looked at it from like a household perspective, if this, if this, either this state we're in California or this country, if you looked at it from that standpoint of hey, our budget, you know, we make, you know, hey, look, here's here's hey, you know, hey, darling wife, we make five thousand dollars a month. That's how much income we bring in. Um, we're gonna buy a car that's gonna cost us two thousand dollars a month, and we're gonna rent a 
uh, 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 an apartment that's going to cost us four thousand dollars a month, and then we're going to go out to eat every night. Mm-hmm. That total is going to be seven thousand dollars a month. You can figure out real quick, like, oh, I'm in the hole. This is the credit card problem. Yeah. So, but if it's not our money, yeah. we're kind of like, hey, we're going to debt a little bit. It's all good. Yeah, we'll yeah, wash yeah, out we'll in take, the end. Yeah, wash out in the end. Yeah, got to be careful with this stuff. <laughs> yep. All right, what do we got? Speaking so, of, speaking of be, being careful, mm, I like it. We got to be careful made. with what we put in our bodies, yeah. especially on this path. The path is hard, Dave Burke. I'm saying it's hard. It's not always easy. It's fun. It can be fun from time to time. Especially when you're collecting those long-term gains. See what I'm saying? Capability, cognitive enhancement, smarts, all that stuff. Better decision-making, too. Either way, when we're on this path, we want to stay healthy, stay ahead of the game health-wise. Dave, I noticed you're drinking the mango discipline. Good choice. You could have drank the orange. You could have. I have a little bit of love-hate relationship with the mango. I understand fully. So (laughs) discipline, go. That's what this is. That's what we're talking about here. It's the healthy energy drink. Yep. It's a big deal. Most times the energy drink, as we know them, or as we knew them. Now you know where I'm going to go with this right now. Where are you going? Well, we were t- talking earlier about the fact that, hey, most companies are out there trying to do the right thing. <laughs> yeah. And guess what we have? Not all we have some <laughs> companies that are out there saying, oh, you know what? If I can cut the cost of my product by a little bit, add some chemicals to it that are a little bit cheaper, mm-hmm. give people an addictive thing called sugar, and they'll just buy more of it. Cool. So we got our example now. We got some nefarious companies I, I agree. out there making poison and feeding yeah. it to people. It's it's kind of a spectrum. To, and, and consider, I'm not just saying necessarily energy drinks or whatever, but like in general, especially when it comes to stuff that you eat or put in your body, whatever, because you're dealing with two different forces there. Yeah. You know what bothers me about that, though, is this like is the attitude of like, yeah, but that's what people want. Right. That's right? what I'm saying. There's that's two different want. forces. And that's not a good that that's that's what people want. That yeah. doesn't mean you can't just make adjustments to give them what they want and not give them poison. Hey, some people want crack. Some people want True. straight exactly. up. And some people want vodka straight up mainstream. Yeah. Some Does people that make want you a good vodka. Person? Is vodka good? Is vodka good? No. Mm-hmm. Kind of hard to make that argument on you know yeah. on many many levels. Either way, I dig what you're saying. But guess what? We don't have to worry about that kind of stuff anymore. We are not a nefarious company. Negative. We are making the clean, the clean, the clean energy drink. Energy drink. Both uh, win-win, upside short term, upside long term. In many ways, God. too. By the way, there's electrolytes in this one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, imagine just being saying, "Oh yeah, you want to try something?" All upside. All. Oh. <laughs> yeah. How often do you get that in life? Yeah. Hey, here's something. All upside. Yeah, and as far as like the mango flavor, it's like really upside. Yeah, especially oh, okay. you see what I'm saying yeah, it's like as compared that. to other flavors, which is just normal upside. Which I understand, of course. Either way, if you want, if you want to take part in this energy drink rather than the yeah. poisonous now energy drink, now we're starting to drink, go down the path. Now we're now we're starting talking about nefarious companies. I'm going straight to the clothing manufacturers next yeah. that are out there cutting the corners and saying, "Oh, we'll just get this made in China." We got slave labor over there. Yeah, we got the Uyghurs over there. In actual slave labor camps, making your making your shorts. Yep. How's that feel? Doesn't feel good. No, I don't feel good about it. I don't feel good about it either. That's why you know what? I don't get I don't get shorts that are made in China. Yep. Yeah, I dig it, man. I dig it. But back to the energy drinks. Okay. You want to stick with those for mental and physical enhancements. Check. Enhance your capability. Also, uh, you can get stuff to to take you out of any kind of roadblocks or speed bumps in recovery. Mm-hmm. We got protein. We got stuff for your joints. We got stuff for your immunity. We also got protein, but you could actually just call it dessert. Yes, another one of those upside needed. upside. I almost had an emergency too. the other day. I thought I ran out of peanut butter. Yeah. Wait, peanut butter flavored milk? Peanut butter, peanut butter flavored milk, yeah. yeah. But then it was in the back of the cabinet. <laughs> sure, the back. But I was Hell like, yeah. a, speaking of crack, yeah. I look like a crack crack cocaine addict. Right. Digging through, like, Wah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, Cause one of my daughters just like went ham on the peanut butter yeah, milk. Makes sense. Yeah. And it was just like down to, I got I got you know, half a scoop, which is not, gonna get you through the moment <laughs> right you uh you mentioned your daughter and they're older your kids are older mine kind of yeah. young where i play tricks on them where they're not tricks it's a strategy you see what i'm saying so i don't give them milk when they want it mm. I, I mean one it's, a, it's I, like a reward yeah you see what i'm saying it creates that that yeah. demand yeah. you see what i'm saying 
So when they when they hit it, boom, that's the standard of yeah. the standard payoff of the dessert. See what I'm saying? Meanwhile, they're getting the, the, the tail end of benefits. See what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. I'm out of peanut butter, by the way. Be little's on the case. Look though. at you with the long war going I'm on. I'm over here trying. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, so we got a bunch of stuff. Where do we get this stuff? Jockofuel.com. Jockofuel. Also, okay, the, the energy drinks you can get at Wawa, you can get at Vitamin Shop, you can get at Jockofuel.com. Yeah. Um, the rest of the stuff, mostly Jockofuel.com and Vitamin Shop. Yeah, hey, just real quick. If you want it delivered, if you don't want to run out of peanut butter milk or whatever else, if you don't want to run out, if you subscribe to it, shipping's free. So that's our way of competing with some other large corporations that may not be as benevolent yeah. as Jocko Fuel. Yeah, it's a good move right there. Subscribe. 100%. Also, Origin USA. This is where mm-hmm. you can get American-made stuff. You yep. said it. You mentioned it. Yep. Like sometimes, hey, some places, some cl- some of the clothes that, that some of... The people where it's made with slave labor straight up <laughs> and varying levels of slave slave labor too you can yeah. go deep in that rabbit hole and find out yeah. some stuff that probably you're not gonna yeah like. you can go on uh, whatever like. those other youtube channels are that you were talking about you can watch you know little kids getting beaten because they didn't produce enough freaking pairs of shorts yeah, yeah bro it uh yeah you can go deep for sure but without depressing anybody or like the factories where they got nets around them for so when the people try and kill themselves yeah. they they hit the net and then they drag them back in and put them back in front of the sewing machine again. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that was really scary. I didn't know that that was real. That was that, real. Yeah, the, but that's a scary thing to consider. Like, that's how common it is that they have a straight up SOP, like mm-hmm. a little protocol yeah. in their place. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is just, just to prevent the people from from actually dying when they try to commit mm-hmm. suicide. That See way we, we can get wanna, another day and a half of labor yeah, out of them. We need that labor. See what I'm saying? For this, for our clothes. So we're whatever. we're not down with that. No, we're not that down with that. So all this stuff is A, made in America, B, made in America by people who want to make this this stuff. They're so fired up. Like, Brett, just grab one person from there. The, okay, so you can, and you can see this on their YouTube channel, by the way. But you see the people making it. They're proud. They'll explain the whole thing to yeah, you. Yeah. They'll be like, oh, yeah, this one is this and this and that. In fact, I saw one where they're saying, hey, I'm making this for this very specific yeah, person. I was yeah. like, damn. That's where I want to get my stuff from. For sure. Shoot. OriginUSA.com. Yeah. It's true. Made in America. Yep. Jiu-Jitsu stuff. Grown in America. Yeah, the seeds. Jiu-Jitsu stuff. Perfect. Boots. By the way, we have we made have we sold the government 24 million pairs of boots? We haven't yet. Yeah. But even if we did, we wouldn't sell them 24 million. Not necessary. Not if they don't need 24 million. No, especially because these boots are going to last. Yeah. So yeah. and you're gonna look good go. too. Let's face it. <laughs> Let's face it. Yeah. <laughs> Echo, if you, if Echo ever goes into combat, he's gonna be looking good. <laughs> that's key component. Of the Seventeen Alpha. Uh, well, that that's something that does have some value. See what I'm saying? Because I think a lot of people we care about, like at the very least, a little bit about what it looks like. Mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? I put on the Delta sixty eight. It's not like I didn't look in the mirror. I was like, it's not like I was like, sure, they fit and then just kind of walked out. Interesting. I looked in the mirror a little bit. And in fact, I remember when I red shirted in football mm-hmm. and we we're warming up for the game. You know, you can you can suit up for the game when you red shirt for football. And the coach said, he was like, dang, Echo looks good in his uniform. He's not ready to play, but he looks good in his uniform. Well, that could be also a foreshadowing of your tactical. Yeah. Your tactical missions in life. You might not be ready to operate, no, but no, you no. will look good. Yeah, that's what I felt when I put in on the Delta, Delta 68. 68. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not ready for, you know, the the Mekong Delta, but I'm ready to, to wear this stuff for sure 100%. Nonetheless, yeah. get it all at Origin USA. It's good stuff. Guilt-free stuff and superior stuff. Yeah. Another win-win on that one. Also, Jocko's a store called Jocko Store. So you go to jockostore.com, and that's where you can represent hardcore on the path. Discipline equals freedom. Good. It's a good way to look at things. Mm-hmm. Good. If you ever that watch is. that video. Yeah, that, that'll that help a lot of us through some some stuff, man. Nonetheless, you want to represent, that's where you can. We've got some other stuff on there. Some shorts, some hats, some hoodies, women's st- stuff. When you heard there, me say well, that good thing for the first time, were you like, oh, this is good? Yeah. I did, you actually. like knew at the moment. Dang, well, if you remember you. how that video came about or whatever, if you even want to call it coming about, I had my camera in the corner. Mm. And when I was reading the notes, like, you know, I'll just go over the notes mm. or whatever. I was like, oh, that one's going to be a good one. So I I didn't even take out the camera and set it up. If you notice, you if you remember, record. yeah, I kind of I brought it out of the corner. And if you watch that video, if you look close, you can see like there's like my computer monitor kind of obstructing. Like yeah. it's, it wasn't set up. It was just I just sort of started running it because I thought, oh, yeah, that's looked 
good in the notes. Mm, check you out, dude. So just right put now. some freaking music on that mother and <laughs> send it out. <laughs> Nonetheless, you want to represent, like I said, jockostore.com. Go there. If you like something, get something. Also, we have a subscription thing, too. Free shipping on this one as well. It's a new, maybe more creative designs on that one. Good feedback on that one. Check. Yeah. Yeah. So the you shirt, got a shirt that says check. Yep, it's true. Yeah, check. Also, sh- you know, uh, there's a, we have an homage to the Sea Wolves on there. Mm-hmm. We've got an homage to another group that we have grown very fond of. That's all I'm going to say, right? Let me that's inspect that say. thing before that's you all. roll it out. That's you all. better let me inspect that thing before you roll it out. Yeah. Why? Please. Because I got to. Oh, you got to have your the input. ominous dominus. Yeah, okay. Just all to right. confirm. All right. Cool. There have been errors made in the past. I think we don't need to bring them up right now, but there have been <laughs> things that have been created without approval okay. and they were not correct. All right. Well, you know, it's a risk we all run. But yes, That's you're correct. And occasionally, I did. occasionally, you know, look, I'm, I'm prone to run things a little bit too decentralized. That's kind of what I do. Yes. But occasionally, let's do a little inspection to make sure we aren't making mistakes that we don't want to make. What do we call a QA quality you know, assurance? quality assurance on yeah. design. Before you yeah. print the shirt and send it to people, you should do that. Yeah. I think you might be right about yeah. that. Actually, oh, okay, I understand what you're saying now. <laughs> yes, I remember. I remember Dave Burke in the house. Actually, yeah. Dave Burke was a big part of that uh, rectification. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. When I say a big part, I mean the part. So mm-hmm. let's let's, let's just it. do a review. Yes, sir. We'll call it a review. Hey, uh, subscribe to this podcast. Wherever you subscribe to podcasts, we also have Jocko Unraveling. We have the Grounded Podcast. We have the Warrior Kid Podcast. We also have Jocko Underground, where we are talking about, uh, let's see, closely related topics. We're answering Q&A, so there's a special way you can send your questions in, and so we're answering Q&A on there, and it is also our place to go in the event of problems. Problems. You, um, if we get banned or you, whatever, you or they like, put advertisements on stuff or whatever. Yeah, you always like gloss over the, the oh, just do Q and A or whatever. And a lot of those questions are like, that's like advice. Like if you want life advice from Jocko, it's sort of the that's essentially life advice it. Column, I guess it is, <laughs> bro. It is. And Jocko Willink, life coach. Yeah. <laughs> JockoUnderground.com. Hell yeah, yeah. It sounds funny when you say it like that, but. Conceptually, you know what's weird is I said that for the first time a long time, like before I even got out of the Navy, because guys would come to me and be like, "Hey, this is going on." I'd be like, "Jago Willink, life coach." Hell yeah, you know. And I'd say, "Here's what you need to do, bro." Hey man, it's effective. (laughs) I'm telling you. Sometimes, like they'll ask these questions, and I'll be like, "Oh yeah, I'll read the question, whatever." And you think you know? You think you know what I'm gonna say? Well. I am, a lot of times I do know what you're going to say oh, okay, in this. general, Echo but, Charles, here's the, but here's the thing. Here's what happens sometimes where someone I'll read the question and, and, and I'll be like, oh yeah, that's a unique question for that, that person. You know, it doesn't really apply to me. So it'd be interesting to hear Jocko's answer, which I may or may not know the answer, uh, you know, as far as the one he's going to give. But then you expand on this answer. And it's like, wait a second. I can kind of <laughs> use that right there. You see what I'm saying? So it kind of yeah, like, yeah. it kind of affects your life, even, even though the question's not like necessarily just yours. If you got questions, you want them answered, you want to hear what we talk about on that underground podcast, go to jockounderground.com. It costs $8.18 a month. That's how you're supporting that whole thing. If you can't afford it, it's cool. We, we still want you in the game. Email assistance at jockounderground.com. We have a YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that. Also, Origin USA has a cool YouTube channel where they're showing behind the scenes what's going on. Psychological Warfare is an album that Echo made. I talked on it. So we made. Sure. Okay. So we made as a as a little collaborative effort. Sure. I came up with the things. I wrote it. I then I did the words and then I said them in a proper way. And Echo <laughs> collaborated by pressing record. Yep. Which was cool. Yep. I do it. Again. So if you want to get the psychological warfare, you need a little help getting through some moment of weakness. We got you. Jocko Life Coach. Okay. We got you. Okay. Uh, if you want something to hang on your walls, go to flipsidecanvas.com. Dakota Meyer. Speaking of Medal of Honor, Dakota Meyer, without question, um, earned that thing. And he's got a cool company, Made in America, flipsidecanvas.com, making stuff to hang on your wall. Got a bunch of books. Final Spin coming out soon. We don't even know what. Is it a book? Is it a novel? Is it a poem? Is it? A, what do you call it, Dave? You've read it. Literature. It's all those things, I guess. Yeah. I know what it says on the cover. Yeah. What does it say on the cover? Final spin? <laughs> oh, it <laughs> no, says a novel. I think so. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they have to call it something. It's, it's more than that. I know that for sure. Yeah. Check. Uh, then we have 
leadership strategy and tactics, field manual. That's gonna answer all your questions about leadership. The code, the evaluation, the protocols. You gotta know, you gotta have a code. You gotta evaluate yourself. You gotta follow some protocols in life. There you go, we wrote them for you. Me and Dave Burke. Discipline equals freedom field manual. Way the warrior kid, one, two, three, and four. Mikey and the dragons. About face by Hackworth. I wrote the forward to it. Extreme ownership and the dichotomy of leadership that I wrote with my brother, Leif Babin. Echelon Front, we have a leadership consultancy. And what we do is we solve problems through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com if you want to have us engage with your company, your business, or your team. Go to echelonfront.com. That's also where you can find out about the live events that we do. We do the muster, big leadership learning session, two days long. Next one up is in uh, Vegas. Las Vegas, October 28th and 29th. We also do field training exercise. We run around and do tactical missions and utilize the principles of leadership. We do EF Battlefield tour, Gettysburg primarily. We don't make you march there, (laughs) but we do walk around there and, and learn those lessons. We have an online training course because we, we, we want to get this information to as many people as possible. How do you do that? How do you scale that? I can't be everywhere. Dave can't be anywhere, everywhere. Leif Babin can't be everywhere. JP can't be everywhere. We can't just be everywhere. So what we did is we consolidated information onto the Extreme Ownership Academy. It's leadership courses. We do live sessions on there all the time. If you have a question, you come there and ask me. Go to extremeownership.com for that. If you want to help service members, active and retired, their families, Gold Star families, Check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a charity organization that does all kinds of great stuff for our military members and our veterans. If you wanna donate or you wanna get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. And if you want more of my prolonged proclamations, or you need more of Echo's derelict decrees, you can find us on the interwebs on Twitter, on the gram, on Facebook. Echo's at Echo Charles. I am at Jocko Willink. Where are you at, Dave? David R. Burke. David R. Burke. I escaped the... Uh, the ridicule? The ridicule. It's nice. What ridicule? You know what? Derelict decrees. For you. <laughs> if, oh, right, right. Yes. If you're not getting ridiculed, it means people don't like you. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and many thanks to all the men and women in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, you are the ones that carry out the will of our country. And you are also the ones who pay the price. And we are forever indebted to you for your sacrifice. And to police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, and all first responders, you step up and you protect us here on the home front and we are indebted to your service as well. And to everyone else out there, this might seem obvious, but think about what you're doing. Weigh the risks and the benefits, the strategic benefits, the reward and the consequences. And make sure, make sure that you are doing the right things for the right reasons. And until next time, this is Dave and Echo and Jocko.